platform party. Conference this afternoon, we will discuss the communities and transport sections of the National Policy Forum report, and we'll also have reports on Wales and Northern Ireland, including a speech by Carwin Jones. At the end of the session, we'll be holding a tribute to remember Joe Cox. Our first debate this afternoon is on the community section of the National Policy Forum report, which is on pages 20 to 23, and also the priority issues document on housing on pages 68 to 71. To move the report on behalf of the National Executive Committee, please welcome Jim Kennedy. Chair Conference, Jim Kennedy, NEC and Unite, to move the Communities Policy Commission report. Conference, this is a big and very, very busy commission. We're tasked with looking at issues affecting communities and local government, housing, environment, food and rural affairs, energy and climate change, and culture, media and sport. Prior to 20, uh, January 2016, these issues were the property of two commissions, living standards and sustainability, and stronger, safer communities. And in recognising our wide remit, I want to thank all the members of the Commission for their dedication and contributions throughout the year. It's been difficult on occasions, and I know one or two Commission members have questioned the effectiveness of their input. But I can assure them they're integral to the work of the Commission and that we will deliver the policies that take us into the next election. Conference, I'd also like to thank John Healy and John Trickett for their hard work while serving on the Commission. But throughout the year, the constant that's kept the Commission and myself on track is our party policy officer, Adam Scott. So a big thank you to him. We have five shadow secretaries of state on the Commission. So issues we have discussed include the government's 25-year food and farming strategy, flooding, the Olympic legacy, the government's housing benefit changes and housing act, energy prices, the BBC, Levinson Part 2, broadband rollout and the government's piecemeal devolution plans. But the priority issue has been the housing crisis in the UK, a subject I feel passionately about. I am the product of a central London council estate and conference my estate was a real community, not the version the Tories try to portray as some sort of sink estate. Our homes were warm and welcoming. We had affordable rents, security of tenure, not the short-term, not guaranteed type of tenancy so often used these days. We had our own support network as well as being well supported by the local authority and its services. We all knew one another, from the caretakers who lived on the estate and to those that lived in the shelter housing on our estate. We had a pride in where we lived. We were the embodiment of community. That's what I had, and that's what tens of thousands of council tenants are fighting to preserve today in the face of the latest and most vicious attack on social housing, the Housing and Planning Act. Even by Tory standards, this act stands as one of the most spiteful and malicious. Its clear intention is to wipe social housing off the map. They intend to cut 350,000 socially rented homes by 2020. They're scrapping permanent secure tenancies for council and social housing tenants. They're going to bulldoze council estates, destroying our communities. And through means testing, they're introducing attacks on social housing tenants who have struggled for years to improve their lives. And now, just as they have reached a level of security, a tax of 15% on their income is to be imposed. The Local Government Association has warned that more than 70,000 social housing tenants could face rent increases averaging around £1,000 a year from next April. Conference. 
My family still hold dear that upbringing we had. Today, I'm a proud Housing Association tenant and I know the benefits that access to decent, affordable social housing brings to ordinary people. Our council flat gave me a good start in life. And unlike many today, I was fortunate to have that access to good housing. And our aim must, to give, our aim must be to give all people the same opportunities. Children living in bad housing are almost twice as likely to suffer from poor health as other children. We must build the homes that give stability and good health to our children and give families a sense of dignity and pride. As Labour, we must deliver that. And daily we hear about the housing crisis, home ownership at its low level for 30 years. And of course, we recognise people's aspirations to home ownership. But let's be clear, it's not going to be Barrett Homes or Wimpy that solve our housing crisis. The key driver of change must be access to decent, affordable social housing. The dramatic decline in house building can be seen in the government's own figures. In 1970, local authorities across the UK built over 175,000 new homes. By 2015, that figure had gone down to a shocking 3,080. Councils used to routinely build around 100,000 homes a year. But with the election of Thatcher in 79, the relentless decline in building began. Right to buy stripped housing stock away from councils, never to be replaced. And councils deprived of funding, and with councils deprived of funding, outsourcing of direct labour organisations became the norm, robbing councils of in-house skilled construction workers and the ability to build our own homes. Yet the social and economic benefits of building homes are widely recognised. Shelter has said for every one pound spent on housing construction, an extra £2.9 is generated in the economy. Given those economic returns from investing in housing construction, it's clear that not only that not building social housing is ideological social engineering. Investing in social house building not only brings immediate benefits to the Exchequer, it brings additional income in the rental stream of current and future tenants. So we know poor housing increases costs to the NHS, the criminal justice system and the benefits bill. But poor housing also has an environmental cost. Badly insulated or ill-designed homes are difficult to heat, increased overall fuel consumptions and consequently have a negative impact on the environment. The environmental agenda is often seen as a preserve of the Green Party, but Labour needs to prioritise these issues and demonstrate their relevance to all our citizens. Conference, we must go on making the case for building social housing. It's overwhelming. We must also demand new standards for the construction workers who will build our homes. Standards that include direct employment, anti-blacklisting agreements, apprentices on all projects, working conditions that are safe in a notoriously unsafe profession, and full worker engagement through trade unions. These standards should not be a guide or a voluntary code, but a prerequisite in the procurement process. And I know there's differences in approach to how to address the housing crisis and deliver the new homes required. But one thing's for certain, it won't happen without our construction workers and it's time they got the respect they deserve. <clears throat> Conference, the work of the Communities Policy Commission is vital and integral to Labour going forward. And I move the report. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, our next speaker is the Shadow Housing Minister, Theresa Pearce. Conference. It's an honour to stand here as Shadow Housing Minister and with a temporary wider brief, including communities and local government. But it's a huge portfolio, so I hope you'll forgive me for the ground that I won't be able to cover this afternoon. But first, I want to say to Labour councillors up and down the country, thank you. New and demanding responsibilities have been transferred to local government, but without the funds to deliver. But in Labour-run councils, you are making a difference, and I'm proud of the ingenuity you've shown in the face of difficult choices. 
finding new solutions, demonstrating just what Labour can do in power. Councils like Derbyshire, that's established a development company to build homes on some of its land for key workers, and the council will provide the mortgages too. This is just one example of many displayed by our councils who are a vital source of Labour representation and increasing inspiration on policy, innovating, forward-looking, credible policy. That is Labour in power in local government. And next year, we have important mayoral elections, including Steve Rotherham here in Merseyside. Both Marvin in Bristol and Sadiq in London have hit the ground running, and one of the biggest issues that they face is the housing crisis. Now, if anybody wants to know where the government's housing priorities lie, it's there for all to see in the Housing and Planning Act, a divisive, aggressive, flawed act which includes an all-out attack on social housing. It will lead to the loss of affordable homes. It fails to help those in the private rented sector. It fails to offer genuine help to those trying to get on the property ladder. And it totally fails to help the increasing number of people up and down the country facing homelessness. In truth, there is little of any merit in this Tory government's plan for housing. They've slashed housing benefit payments to young people under 35. They failed to build social housing. They've allowed private sector rents to rocket and forced millions into low paid, insecure employment, making owner occupation impossible. Is it any wonder that 40% of adults under 34 are still living with their parents and still the housing benefit bill continues to balloon? It is currently running at 25 billion every year because millions are forced into the private rented sector because there is no alternative. It makes no economic sense whatsoever. And this is not just a crisis for those who are homeless or for those who are living in under, overcrowded slums. It's a crisis for all of us. The houses, cr housing crisis isn't just about bricks and mortar. It's about people and their life chances. Without a stable home, education and health are affected and family cohesion can be shattered. It's about the children under 10 who are already in their third primary school and the teachers who are struggling to deal with classroom churn every month. It's about the GPs who can't build patient relationships because patients in their thousands move on and off their register each year as they shift from one private rented home to another. It's about the children who are growing up disaffected, unable to build the roots and the childhood friendships that are vital to their future self-esteem. And it's about the isolation of the elderly who have spent their whole lives in a street that now has numerous houses of multiple occupancy and they are isolated and no longer know their neighbours. And then there are all the families struggling to meet next month's mortgage payment. Those who are living in fear of being sick or losing their job. Losing your job shouldn't mean losing your home, but for many families it does. MPs and councillors' surgeries are full of families who tell us they are living in damp, overcrowded conditions. They tell us that their accommodation is making their children ill. And they tell us for all this they pay extortionate rent. They tell us they fear eviction. They tell us they are desperate. And they are. We are facing the biggest housing crisis in a generation. And the Tories have no answers other than building a few starter homes for those who probably could get on the housing ladder anyway. So what would a Labour Housing and Planning Act look like? First, we would remove the shackles from local government so they could build the homes of all tenures and the infrastructure their communities need. Labour will commit to building over a million new homes in the next parliament with half as social housing and invest... and invest in the construction skills to tackle the skills shortage and train up a generation. And through our National Investment Bank and Regional Development Banks, we'll also provide the necessary infrastructure. In the private rented sector, end of a tenancy is a rising cause of homelessness. So we would change the rules on tenancies where a three-year lease becomes the norm. Setting up not-for-profit... <laughs> setting up not-for-profit letting agencies to promote longer-term stable tenancies for responsible tenants and good landlords. 
We would introduce a national standard to ensure that private rented properties are fit to live in. We, we, would, reverse, we would reverse the government's pay-to-stay policy and, following examples set by Wales and in Scotland, we will suspend the right to buy. The right to buy can only make any sense in a time of surplus. In a time of shortage, it makes no sense at all. The difference between us and the Tories is they think housing is about property, whereas we know it's about homes, communities and life chances. And now... <laughs> so now the work begins to secure a Labour government to transform our country and the lives of the people that we seek to serve. Thank you. Thanks, Theresa. I'm now pleased to introduce Nick Forbes, who will present a report on the work of Labour in local government. Thank you, Conference. I'm honoured to be here, having been elected in February to succeed Jim McMahon as the leader of Labour local government. I congratulate Jeremy on his re-election as leader of the party and local government looks forward to working with Jeremy to get him into Downing Street. In my role, I'm privileged to work with great people like Anne Lucas and Alice Perry, who represent councillors on the NEC, my deputies on the LGA, Steve Bullock and Sharon Taylor, and all the officers and executive members of the LGA Labour Group and the Association of Labour Councillors. And above all else, I'm privileged to work with every one of our 7,000 Labour councillors. It is Labour councillors that are out there giving a voice to our local communities, putting Labour values into practice. Labour councillors are the campaigners, the door knockers, the fundraisers, the builders, the protectors, the visionaries, the backbone of our party and of our movement. And the foundation the foundation of Labour in local government is solidarity. We rise together. We celebrate our successes together. And in difficult times, we support each other. And there's no doubt that we're in difficult times. The road back to government is a long and a hard one. Labour councils are the front line in the battle against mindless Tory austerity. Labour councils have faced cuts up to 10 times deeper than those in Tory areas. And Labour councils have stretched every sinew to shield the most vulnerable in our communities from these cuts. Nationally, we campaigned against the bedroom tax. And Labour councils have stepped in with financial advice and support through council tax relief schemes to ease the burden. Nationally, we exposed the unfairness of the Tory cuts agenda. And Labour councils have worked with community groups, the voluntary sector and trade unions to find innovative ways of keeping vital public services going. But there's another attack on the horizon. This government is introducing a new right to buy policy, this time for housing association tenants. It's to be paid for by a new levy on council housing, the Tory council house tax. It's the opposite of buy one, get one free for social housing. We lose one, and then we lose another one to pay for it. At a time when our need for affordable homes have never been greater, the future of social housing has never been so much under threat. They attack our council houses conference because we know that they don't care about the people who live in them. It's a shameless attack on the basic worth of an individual. The Tories simply do not see the value in someone that needs a helping hand. Where we see lost opportunity and ability and are determined to put this right, they see nothing but cost and a drain on resources. There is no greater example of this than the failure of this government to sort out the abomination, the disgrace, 
that is the Calais jungle. Shut it down now, Mrs May. We stand ready to take these abandoned children, to provide them with homes, welcome them into our communities, and give them the opportunity of a better life in Britain. To stand by and to continue to ignore their suffering is a moral outrage. <laughs> Conference. Labour councillors stand on the front line of these battles every day. In local government, we've introduced a living wage, created jobs and apprenticeships, brought together universities, colleges and companies to boost innovation, supported new startups and given a hand to sole traders, improved transport links and extended broadband, attracted global investment to our towns and cities. And I'm particularly proud to have developed an agreement between Labour local government and the trade unions. For the first time ever, setting out clearly how we'll work with each other in the years ahead. So this is the road to Labour victories, campaigning for a better tomorrow while doing what we can to improve today, shielding the vulnerable now but investing too for a better future, giving a voice to our communities and offering opportunity for everyone to succeed, solidarity with each other and support for all who need it. The world the Tories want is a dark one for those who don't stand tall at the top. Our mission is to show, in the darkest of times, that Labour local government is a beacon of hope that things can, will and do change for the better under Labour. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. We will now move to debate on the Communities Report. Can I see um, those who want to speak, and then I'll take speakers in rounds of three. Yeah, I've got the woman with the red jacket at the front. Um, I've got the woman there with the pink CAC paper. Um, and I have got the chap there holding what looks like a blanket. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does. Good afternoon, conference. I'm the woman with the red jacket. Um, I'm also sometimes known as Judy Billing, um, and I'm vice chair of the Association of Labour Councillors, representing the 7,000 councillors that Nick referred to earlier. Labour councillors are sometimes the unsung public face of the Labour Party, in real places, with real people, doing ordinary things in a quite extraordinary way, and sometimes doing extraordinary things in a remarkably ordinary way. The way they conduct themselves locally can really affect the way in which the Labour Party is seen in both local and national elections. And I think we forget that at our peril. Sometimes, although Nick has spoken about the um, battles that we fight every day, and I thought, yes, I do fight battles every day, but actually, sometimes we are also the kinder and gentler face of the, work, of the Labour Party, working constantly with the needs of extremely vulnerable people. Refugees, people without homes, people without jobs, food or income, looked after children and elderly people, sometimes socially isolated and with complex care needs. They don't want to hear us being angry and battling, although that's what we have to do politically. But with them, we have to present the kinder, caring, social welfare right side of the work that Labour councillors do every day in their communities. We can be one of several things in our daily life at the moment. We can be part of a Labour council, and, and Nick has talked about the great triumphs of Labour councils coping with the Tory government, coping bravely and indefatigably with the awful legislation that does not help their communities and the people that they represent. Or we can be, 
in opposition, and I'll come to that a little bit more in a second, or even coalition locally as well as nationally. Some of our colleagues have to deal with UKIP councillors. Can you imagine that? Some of you can. It's a disgusting but hopefully temporary blip in the way that we have to conduct ourselves in local government. Do not minimise the complications, the hurdles, or the impact on people's lives that we as Labour councillors can and do have, whatever the obstacles put in our way. And sometimes we even manage to do it with humour. I don't know how that happens, but I have heard Labour councillors laugh, maybe hysterically. <laughs> but the point I want to make about opposition is that our one councillor in Huntingdon our two councillors in Brentwood and our three councillors in Somerset are as of massive importance to the Labour Party as Manchester and Durham with nearly 200 councillors between them. Because in whatever circumstance we operate, with a huge majority or a tiny minority, we are dealing every day with education where we provide ever-improving schools and results, not just in a time of grammar school fury and outrage, which is quite right that we should be outraged at such a stupid suggestion in 2016, but local councillors are dealing with unfair Tory education policies every day, all the time. In housing, we have to provide for those who find the phrase affordable housing both incomprehensible and laughable. And since some of us are sharing our housing backgrounds this afternoon, I was brought up in a flat that my parents rented in Paddington from a nice chap called Mr Rachman. In public health, we work with the NHS and ensure our support to help keeping services doing what they're meant to do in the most appropriate places. On welfare rights, we are campaigning and working with people on an individual basis. We are desperate about providing accessible transport to keep our communities active, vibrant and sociable as people are meant to be, to enable participation in sports, in theatre, in meeting and talking to others. And we provide and care about clean, green and regenerated cities, towns, villages and coastal areas too, many of which are suffering greatly at the moment. These things are the basic needs of the societies that we as local councillors struggle cheerfully and, as I've already said, occasionally even with humour to provide. Don't underestimate the task and please listen to what we have to tell you because we are truly on the front line and conference and party leadership, you ignore us and our advice at your peril. Good afternoon, conference. Uh, Susan Carstairs from Sky, Loch Harbour and Badnoch CLP. Um, I wanted to say first that I'm delighted that the environment is being included on the first day of the conference and not like it normally is on the last day when everybody's packing up and going home. But I would like to put in a plea for giving a higher priority to environmental issues within the large package that we're looking at now. Um, the figures that come out about resource use across the planet are talking about us in Western Europe drawing on the resources of three planets to maintain our living conditions at the moment. Um, the Labour Party as an international party is obviously opposed to the idea that we would be benefiting against people elsewhere in the world and it is also clear that we are drawing on the world's capital to achieve this kind of resource use, it's not sustainable and we need to bring an end to it. Climate change is one of the key issues in the whole thing of uh, the whole sphere of resource use. It's about how we use the shared climate that we all need to live on. And we have enacted excellent climate change legislation in this country and it's been largely pushed by the Labour Party. Ed Miliband did a great job when he was at Department of Energy and Climate Change, and Sarah Boyack and Claudia Beamish now in Scotland are doing a terrific job of pushing that through locally. We are trying to achieve an 80% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050, 
and it's a huge task. It's not going to happen by us making small adjustments in the way we live. It needs to be integrated into all areas of policy. We need to have this issue of sustainable resource use underlying everything that we do in health and transport and communities and industrial policy. And I would just make a plea for the Labour Party to think about how we can achieve that. Um, I would like to make two clear messages. One is that we need more government intervention to achieve these aims. There's been a lot of discussion about how we can try and finesse environmental outcomes through the free market. I don't think it's going to work ever. It's the, the, the shared resources are not marketable. They're, we've attempted to, to try and create markets. It's been quite clumsy. It doesn't work. We need direct intervention. And the second thing is that, uh, well, it's just that point again that sustainable resource use needs to underline every area of policy. There's a lot of discussion now about how to achieve more manufacturing in the UK. I think that's great. Um, but we need to, it needs to be on a base of sustainable use of resources in the UK. And I hope we will take that into account when we're looking at manufacturing. Finally... If you can wind up now, please. Yeah. OK, I just wanted to say uh, it's not... This is an issue of environmental justice as well. We need to take account of uh, issues such as fuel poverty and uh, our shared polluted environment. Thank That's you. it. Thank you. Um, uh, before I ask the next speaker to speak, I'm just going to call three more speakers. Um, yes, the lady there in the front, yeah. Um, there's um, a lady waving at me uh, there. Uh, yep, yeah, yes, you, yeah. Um, and there is um, oh, a chap with a hard hat there as well. <laughs> Conference, I am so proud to come here today to talk about communities. Up and down our country, our local councillors are working hard to achieve the things we need to achieve when we're in opposition and not in power to make people's lives tolerable through austerity. I think this has been a brilliant report from the MPF and I thank them from the bottom of my heart for all of their hard work. However, delegates, I think there is one key issue which this report perhaps has missed out on and that is the full implementation of these proposals. How is it that we get from where we are now, an economy in tatters, without the organization to achieve the things it needs to achieve, to a society of prosperity? I say to you, look at the Labour councils up and down this country, which are turning towards social enterprise and community interest companies. In Croydon, where I'm from, I am so proud that under Tony Newman, we've begun to use social enterprise to deliver on the things we need to deliver on. There is nothing unsocialist about enterprise, my fellow delegates. I remind you of the Glasgow builders who at the turn of the 20th century saw the lack of housing and came together to provide it. If we create the legal structures like community interest companies, which allow for non-for-profit companies to operate, then we will see those successes. What we need to do as labor councils and as labor authorities in the cities is to begin to provide the funding. There is a capital market failure in this country, delegates, for non-for-profit companies because they do not offer high returns. My previous delegate spoke about the failures of the market. Well, that is a perfect example. If you want to change things now, not in 2020, but now, then we need to invest in social enterprise. If you are genuinely committed to empowering the people in the communities we represent, then support social enterprise. Delegates, big industries, Big organizations are taking away from the power of communities 
to solve problems in the way in which they want to. If we want to solve the energy crisis, then we should look to having community interest companies at the micro level generating energy for their communities. It's been done in other countries. If we want to solve the crisis in arts funding, then we should look to community interest companies to provide the facility to do it. My fellow delegates, I call upon you to support this. Look to the people and their power rather than always to big organisations. Thank you. Chair Conference, Wendy Simon from Unison, proud to be representing the largest union in local government. There is almost universal consensus that adequate provision of social care is one of the biggest challenges that faces local government today, and also that social care funding is in crisis. Central government funding for local authorities having been cut by 37% in real terms over the last spending period. When demand increases are taken into account, local authority spending on adult social care has fallen by nearly a third since 2010. The cut in central government funding is only part of the story, as an increase in demand based on a growing and ageing and a more poor community adds to pressure. By the financial year 2020 to 21, it is expected that spending on social care as a percentage of GDP will be barely more than a half of 1%. Although the national living wage is a step in the right direction towards the full living wage, it has not been properly funded. Better care funding money is being held back until later in the Parliament when it is really needed now. The relationship between local authorities and those that care for them is shaped by dysfunctional commissioning practices. The lack of certainty is frequently passed on to the workforce in the form of zero-hour contracts. The vast majority of councils in England are still commissioning 15-minute home care visits. There is inadequate funding for hourly rates and a glaring failure to tackle non-compliance with the national minimum wage. Less than a quarter of councils in England and Wales make, a, make it a contractual condition for care providers to pay for workers' travel time, the main reason for minimum wage non-compliance. The widespread failure to pay home care workers for their travel time is significantly undermining care standards and condemning a large proportion of the workforce to poverty. This sends out a message that care workers do not deserve to be respected for their work. Not paying travel time encourage, encourages the practice of call clipping, where home care workers leave visits early in order to cut down the amount of time they have to spend working for free. Unison has been encouraging councils to improve the delivery of their home care services by adopting the union's ethical care charter. The Charter was designed as a simple way for councils to improve home care standards for both the vulnerable people they are responsible for and for the workers who provide the care. The Charter is a set of commitments that councils make which fix minimum standards, ensure that there is continuity of care, ends 15-minute visits for personal care and pays staff a living wage and ensures that they are paid for their travel time. 18 local councils in England, Wales and Scotland have now adopted the Ethical Care Charter and there are many more who are considering the adoption. The Charter has already had positive results for both care workers and care users. For example, in Southwark, Labour Council found the concrete evidence of an improvement in services, better staff recruitment and retention, improved take-up of training and most importantly, better outcomes for service users. Islington's Labour Council had similar positive feedback since the introduction of the London Living Wage, where turnover amongst staff fell from over 10% to less than 3%. 
This is how Labour in power makes a difference for service users, the workforce and the whole community. What Unison wants to see is Labour councils hiring workers based on the Ethical Care Charter. That's why we need to see the Labour Party locally and nationally focused on winning in power. It's no good being in opposition. Unison members need Labour in power. Let's all make it happen. Thank you. Conference, Steve Maffin, representing UCAT, Northern Region, speaking on the community's debate on housing. Make no mistake, the issue of housing is being used by this Tory government as a political weapon. Leading lights of their party, such as Margaret Thatcher and Dame Shirley Porter, had always used, viewed housing as a frontline political issue. In Nick Clegg's memoirs, he quotes, George Osborne as saying, social housing breeds Labour voters. The recent Housing and Planning Act is a concerted attempt to eradicate social housing in Britain. We are about to experience social engineering on a massive scale. Housing associations will be forced to sell their stock at huge discounts through the right to buy scheme. Local councils will then be forced to reimburse the housing associations by selling high value council property. And the end result, no social housing. London's local authorities have enormous property portfolios. Brent, for example, one of the UK's most deprived areas, has a wholly owned property portfolio worth in excess of 2.2 billion pound. That's over 2,000 houses and 4,000 flats. Unmodernised Victorian houses in Brent will fetch over £600,000, flats £400,000. The neighbouring borough of Ealing has a wholly owned property portfolio of £2.4 billion. I think you're getting the picture. That's what the Tories would like to get their hands on. These valuable state assets, their our assets, will end up in the hands of property developers who are generally Tory party donors. Local authorities, of course, sell at auction. To buy at auction, you need cash. It won't be social, social housing tenants who are bidding. No, they, those unfortunate tenants will be ushered into the arms of unscrupulous landlords. They will need to be supported by housing benefit. And I'm sure you're way ahead of me by now. The housing benefit goes into the pockets of the Tory property developer. Conference. If we don't fight this social engineering, we will see a return to the slum landlords of the Victorian era. We don't even have to go back that far. I'm sure you heard the reaction before. Most people do remember the Rackman Empire, and that was a crime against human decency. Thank you. Before I ask the next speaker to speak, I'm just going to call another round of uh, three, please. Um, yeah, I've got the lady in the black dress waving the CAC report. Um, I've got um, the um, guy towards the back again with the CAC report and a red tie. Yeah. Um, and I have got a woman over there um, sat down with the CAC report. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, conference. Hi. So excited to be here. Gail Hodson, West Lanksborough Council. Mine's just a quickie, you'll be pleased to hear, said the actress to the bishop. So here we go. <laughs> we do need to keep climate change high on the agenda as it is escalating at a rate that was, it is even more than was predicted. And a lot of us are seeing this in our communities up and down the country with the flooding. This next winter is predicted to be wetter and warmer. So it's got even going to get worse. So we must keep this on the agenda. I would like to applaud Jeremy Corbyn's pledge to ban fracking as part of Labour's new green agenda. <laughs> I 
I'm pledging to massively increase renewed, renewable energy jobs, creating tens of thousands of sustainable jobs. Fracking is not compatible with climate change prevention, and we cannot keep looking backwards to a polluting, dirty fossil fuel industry which threatens our health and our environment and is being rejected by communities across the UK. Can I ask Conference to get behind, behind and support Jeremy's pledge, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Laura Pidcock from Blythe Valley Unite the Union delegate speaking to the NPF report on housing. Every single person should have a home as a fundamental right. And that right has too much been left in the hands of the private market. It's a market that has been relaxed, leaving people in insecure tenancies, in squalid conditions, 21st century slum landlords and gnawing tenants pleased to remove mould and damp. They pack as many people as possible into properties to make sure their profits are large. Good quality housing for our communities should be a right, not a commodity bought and sold in the international monopoly game of property portfolios. And as a movement, we must stand firm and say again and again that immigrants are not to blame for the housing crisis. It isn't. It isn't the Syrian refugee that prevents people from having a house. It's a government that doesn't care and a government that has failed. Following the sell-off under Thatcher, we have had decades of councils not building homes leading to a critical shortage. Because of the government cuts, the housing stock that we do have, we're not able to maintain. The, doesn't, the government does not care about people who live in council homes. Fence is not fixed. Tenants wait in months for basic repairs to be done. These people pay their rent and they deserve an excellent standard of housing. The solution, the solution is so frustratingly simple. We need a mass council housing building program, creating not only hundreds of thousands of homes, but thousands of jobs for the construction sector in the process. And if we are directing this investment through local councils, we need public procurement so that we can make sure those jobs are good jobs with proper employment rights and ensure that the scandalous practice of blacklisting is consigned to history. We welcome that the NPF report says that building homes, including more council homes, will be a priority. It has to be at the front and centre of our agenda as a Labour movement. Unite are looking forward to being fully involved in this consultation. Thank you. Conference, Jeff Cuthbert, Police and Crime Commissioner for Gwent. Policing is a very important part of community life, and it is a key public service like any other. But the police are not responsible for policing alone, and the reality is that it must work in partnership with other key public service providers, such as health, local government, housing, and transport. Plus, of course, the third sector, which plays such an important role in sustaining the well-being of our citizens and communities. All key public services in Wales are devolved to the Welsh Government, including the other emergency services except policing. Now, here I would disagree with some comments that I know are going to be made later on in the conference, that policing is about law enforcement. Well, of course it is the job of the police to catch the bad guys. No one would deny that. That's part of the core responsibilities. But policing is also about prevention and reassurance. In Wales, we have the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, and this futuristic act compels all the devolved public services to work together through statutory public service boards with sustainable development and the well-being of citizens at the heart of everything they do. But policing is not devolved, so cannot be required 
as formal partners to contribute to the work of the public service boards. Given that policing is key to the well-being of citizens, this is a difficult problem which could undermine the effectiveness of the public service boards. However, the police are statutory invitees to the PSBs, so must be invited to take part in the PSB's work. But there can be no compulsion. So far, the attitude of the four police and crime commissioners in Wales is positive. We will be taking up the invitation to get involved. However, unless policing is devolved, we cannot be sure that future police and crime commissioners will have the same attitude. Now, there are, of course, very important issues to be resolved prior to the devolution of policing. These include funding arrangements, cross-border issues, serious organised crime and counter-terrorism. It would be wrong to wait until devolution happens and then address these matters. The four Welsh PCCs are ready to work with the Welsh Labour Government and the UK Government. Comrades, it is not sustainable long term to keep this key public service as a reserved matter when all the other key partners are devolved. Now, I'm calling on our UK leadership to commit to the devolution of policing to Wales, as has happened already in the case of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Wales is the only part of the UK where Labour is in power. Our values of social justice and fairness must prevail in all aspects of public service delivery. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to take another round of um, three before the next speaker talks. Um, yeah, there's a guy there with a conference programme. Yeah. Um, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a guy there with a purple bag, yeah, um, and there's a, a woman there with a, with a report, yeah, yeah, you. Yes, please. Good afternoon, conference. I am Nazia Rahman, a delegate of Makerfield CLP and a councillor in Tilsley. It's an honour for me to be here today. Being here today is an incredible part of my long personal journey, which started 13 years ago in Pakistan. I am where I am today because of labor policies of tolerance, fairness, diversity, multiculturalism, and above all, belief in women without any distinction of color, creed, and religion. Conference, it's more important than ever that we come together in unity as a party that's in power in 2020. Today, we are facing huge cuts on our public services, health and education. We are bringing up a generation with no resources. Unemployment is crippling our future. The passion of our youth is fizzling out in disappointment. Our elderly and disabled are not getting the care that they deserve. As a country, we are divided and polarized than ever before. Emergency services are at the brink of collapse because conservative government does not care about us and about communities. But conference, I'm still hopeful. I truly believe that only labor values can restore faith in diversity and multiculturalism and unite us as a country. Only labor can ensure the innovation and progression by redistribution of wealth. Social justice, only labor can achieve social justice, economic prosperity, and equality. Only with labor values can our communities thrive and our youth achieve what they aspire for. But conference, we'll have to go back to the doorstep We'll have to go back to the communities and we'll have to listen to people's needs. We will have to take this passion out of this conference hall, on the doorstep and into the streets. We'll have to transform our adversity into an effective social and political movement. I believe only Labour Party and its values are a hope, a hope for working class, a hope for disadvantaged, a hope for disabled, 
a hope for an immigrant, a hope for you, a hope for me, a hope for nation, and a hope for generations. Thank you. Good afternoon, conference chair, Alan Tate, Communication Workers Union. Speak the housing uh, issue in the uh, community's document. And as, be, as has been mentioned already previously today by numerous delegates, the UK's housing crisis is driven by a lack of supply, sending prices and rents out of control. The government's policy is systemically worsening a crisis and places the greatest burden on the most vulnerable. We should not be surprised, therefore, at the most. Uh, sorry, we should not be surprised that the High Commission report is so damning, and the Equality and Human Rights Commission has noted high proportions of ethnic minority households living in substandard housing, disproportionate number of young people aged 16 to 24 living in overcrowded housing, and a shortfall in site provision for travellers, and a shortfall of housing for women and children seeking refuge from domestic violence. The UK needs to build 250,000 new homes each year to keep up with demand from a growing population. The government's response to the crisis, the Housing and Planning Bill, is not fit for purpose. The government has, however, consistently failed to meet the scale of the house building in this country. In the 12 months of December 2015, 143,500 houses were built, which is over 100,000 short of the number required. Amongst the catalogue of government policy failures is the Cameron Osborne legacy of pay to stay. Families in low rent affordable housing with combined income of £31,000 or £40,000 if you live in London will be classified as high income social tenants. Given that London living wage is roughly £18,570 per annum, this policy labels those on low and middle incomes as the rich and taxes them as if their housing were a luxury item. Pay to stay is typically uh, of the government's denial of poverty and a tax on working class communities. Hard working people are expected to subsidise the lives of others while the government continues to subsidise private landlords to an eye watering nine, £9 billion through housing benefit. Analysis provided for the local government association projects that over 70,000 households will each uh, will earn above the £31,000 income threshold and outside of London, the £40,000. Sorry, in, 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 inside the capital. Average monthly, monthly rents uplifts would be £72 for households outside of London and £132 a month for those living inside the capital. That's an average of £1,065 a year. The Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, made a continual reference to his bus driver father and seamstress mother during his successful campaign. Based on that example, a bus driver in London with overtime will typically earn in excess of £24,000 per annum, with a seamstress on overtime potentially earning up to £22,000 per annum. Such an affected household will see rent increases by an average of just over £1,000 per annum, all of which will go to pay off the national debt a debt that was caused by bankers, not hard-working families struggling to make ends meet. We need to reduce... <laughs> we need to urgently campaign, uh, comrades, to, to change this uh, and suspend this uh, pinocchio and really uh, damaging bill that uh, has been introduced by the government. If we can't do that, then I would urge uh, the Labour in government in 2020 to make sure it is removed. Thank you. Good afternoon, conference. Peter Middlehurst, Wigan CLP, first time delegate and speaker at party conference. It's great to be speaking on this issue as a young Labour Party member, one who can be proud of our leadership and track record of legislation in government on tackling the biggest threat that humanity currently faces, climate change. Just as I am part of the generation that witnessed the immense change of the internet revolution, I want us, our generation, to be the next that witnesses the next transition in our lifetimes. 
the complete transformation from the constant burning of fossil fuels, heavily polluting our atmosphere, to the creation of 200 localised democratic clean energy networks in the next parliament, where families and businesses source their fuel from the local community, breaking up the big six, Britain's clean, green energy revolution of the 21st century. It sounds good, but this bigger picture for a more sustainable planet is only achievable with the smaller but significant changes we as Labour Party members can make happen from the grassroots up. It's about ensuring when on the doorstep we are convincing voters of the benefits of positive energy and climate change policy, showing them how Labour-led councils like Nottingham have reduced the bills for residents at the same time as slashing emissions by installing solar panels on 4,000 homes. It's by showing voters how Steve Rotherham in Merseyside and Andy Burnham in Greater Manchester can make a real difference in our city regions as our new Metro Mers come May. And how leading up to 2020 general election, a Labour-led government can turn around 10 years of government failure and environmental policy by fully implementing all EU environmental protection laws post-Brexit, insulating 4 million homes and put an end to the growing public health emergency that is 40 to 50,000 early deaths per year due to air pollution and national disgrace. As a result of one decision in particular, however, I would like to send a very direct message from this United Labour Conference Hall to someone who I'm sure will be watching this afternoon, our new Prime Minister. Theresa May, austerity does not work. Scrapping an entire Department of State our Department for Energy and Climate Change will not help but hinder the chances of you achieving your budget surplus. Don't continue the pattern of shaping green policy in this country, started in 2010 under David Cameron, in a way that our children and our grandchildren will look back on in shame. Instead, give us the thousands and thousands of green jobs promised, jobs in engineering, manufacturing and environmental research, skilled jobs that are so desperately needed right now in working class towns like mine of Wigan, and up and down the United Kingdom, but also to build the foundations of an industry that will create the jobs of the future. Jobs that will keep families like mine ticking over, families that haven't even started and don't even exist yet, but in decades to come will, and will need a booming prosperous industry to rely on to put food on the table and keep the roof above our heads. Stop the rhetoric on short-term ideological solutions and start giving our country a leading role once again in the fight against climate change one which we can all be proud of. I'm just going to call another round of um, speakers. Um, there's a guy there in a sort of orangey yeah, jacket, been waiting very patiently. Um, there's um, a guy waving a white piece of paper there. Yep, yes, you, yeah. Um, and there is, yeah, there's a, a woman waving a scarf just there. <laughs> oh, thank you, Chair. Carol Wilcox, Christchurch and uh, Labour Land Campaign. Um, many previous speakers have spoken about the basic human right of housing. As far back as I, I, I can remember, there's been a housing crisis. I can remember Cathy come home. I'd like to put three facts in front of you. House values are mostly land value. It's location, location, location. The owner of a 200 million pound mansion in Westminster pays a hundred pound less council tax than the tenant of a flat in Weymouth who's paying 345 pounds a month. There is an inverse relationship between house price and council tax. One of the solutions to the housing crisis is a land value tax. This redistributes land wealth and it makes land cheap so that councils can buy land to actually build council housing. Before World War II, land value tax was the main economic policy of the Labour Party. 
If we'd had land value tax in 1945, we would never have had a housing crisis, we would never have had gross inequality, and we would never have had a banking crash. Chair Conference, um, Steve Battlemuch, Labour Councillor, Nottingham City, one of 52 of 55 Labour Councillors in the city, and proud that we've got a success story to tell you. There's a massive issue of, of energy poverty in this country, fuel poverty. 2.3 million households living in fuel poverty. One in two low-income families are struggling to pay to stay warm despite being in work. So Nottingham Labour Council a few years ago realised that something had to be done. And instead of just thinking about switching sites and all that sort of stuff and petitioning the big six, what we decided to do was set up our own energy company. And I'm proud to say that after a year now, we're a year on. Robin Hood, Robin Hood Energy was launched a year ago, supported by a loan from Nottingham City Council. We wanted cheaper prices for Nottingham residents. We, we wanted cheaper prices for all residents. So it's open to everybody in England, Scotland and Wales. And you can switch today to Robin Hood Energy. One of the reasons we did that was the issue of low prices on working class people. Over 10 million households have prepayment meters or card meters. When those people go and get energy, they pay through the nose for it. They pay more for their energy than you do if you do it through direct debit. And we thought that was wrong. And so when we brought in Robin Hood Energy, we made sure that the cheapest possible prices were for those prepayment meters, putting our socialist principles into practice. So I say to you, as a Labour Council, you can now go out and through your own council, come back to Nottingham and link up with us and make your own energy companies by using our energy but calling it what you like. It's called white labelling and I applaud Leeds City Council who have joined with us in that uh, respect and others. <laughs> Finally, I'd say the big six energy companies are not just big on profits, but they're rubbish on customer service. We are trying to change that. We've got to get a situation now where we put the customer at the heart. Jeremy Corbyn has said in his energy policy launch, which he did in Nottingham two weeks ago, that he wants to see the decentralisation of the energy companies and a breakup of the big six to allow energy to come from the bottom up. There's lots of lessons to be learned from other countries, from Europe, from Germany. But in Nottingham, we've made a start, and I urge you all to get behind it. Thank you. Councillor Kuldeep Sahota, Telford and Recon Council. Conference, I'm not here to explain the meaning of Brexit because nobody knows what he means, not even the Prime Minister. However, I am here to talk about the Brexit effect on community relations. Two days after the EU referendum, my wife was closing the shop and the youth approached her. And he said, I thought we had voted to send you Paki's home. And I thought, and conference, she was really upset about it, and she had been in this country for 40 years. Obviously, the police was involved, and so on. But conference, this was not an isolated incident. This happened everywhere, up and down our country. The language used by some in the referendum campaign was verging on racism, which reminded me of the 60s and the 70s. The language, the, the language and the images bashing so-called bloody foreigners as if they are responsible for the woes of our country. 
language even Enoch Powell would have been proud of. And I'm sorry to say this, but even some BME communities fell for this argument. Conference. Brexit is in danger of putting community relations back by some 50 years in our country. As we move forward, the referendum result, beyond the referendum result, we must all work hard to eradicate this poisonous hatred once and for all. And conference, <laughs> and conference, only labor values will steer us to a future where community cohesion is at the heart of what we do. Thank you. I'm just going to take one final round of um, contributions, please. Um, yeah, there's a lady over there waving what looks like an iPad. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a there's a there's a chap jumping up and down enthusiastically. And there is um, someone over there waving some papers. Yeah. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Conference. I speak to you today on behalf of Worcester CLP. Worcester, which some of you might know, is one of the 100 key marginals we must win to take power to the millions of people in our country who desperately need a Labour government. We made real progress in Worcester this year. We held off UKIP in my ward and we took control of the City Council from the Tories. <laughs> Albeit with the help of the Green Party. It is a real honour to have been elected to Worcester Council this year. It's a fantastic place to live and I'm proud to call it my home. But like all parts of our country, there are problems. They can only be fixed by a Labour government. There are people who are struggling to get by and those who just about manage, but worry about how their children will earn a living in the uncertain world. One of our biggest worries is housing, or the lack of it. In my city, the waiting list for social housing is over 2,000. Thousands of people are living in the private rented sector unable to buy a home and stuck in short-term contracts with ever-rising rents and no security of tenure. The brutal Tory government's myopic obsession with home ownership at the expense of all else is making this situation worse. In Worcester, Labour's policies on housing are about securing the links with housing associations and enabling the building of more social housing though it is going to become increasingly difficult for residents of rented housing when the unfair pay-to-stay policy of this rotten government is implemented. The Labour Party must develop innovative solutions to tackle the housing crisis head-on. Yes, of course we need to build more council homes, as Labour councils across the country are doing. But to win in Worcester, we need a broad offer to win people back to voting Labour. We are working to tackle rogue, land rogue landlords, and in Worcester, landlords are being made responsible to provide homes for rent of a decent standard and to maintain them at that standard. Recently, we successfully prosecuted an irresponsible owner of a Worcester home illegally rented to students, and they were ordered by the courts to pay out nearly £4,000. At a time of acute housing shortage, we must crack down on empty properties. Last year, over a thousand properties were found to be unoccupied in Worcester, with 500 of them empty for over six months. This does not make sense. When we have 2,000 people on our waiting list, we must utilise any powers we have to bring these properties that could be decent homes back into use. We need to build more homes to help people onto the housing ladder and by forming policies like this, we can show that we understand people's desire to have a home of their own, whether rented or bought. 
in London, Sadiq is leading the way in tackling the excesses of the private rented sector. His new London living rent, with rents pegged to a third of local take-home pay, will help thousands of people who don't qualify for social housing, but are still priced out of buying a home. By applying this type of radical approach across the country, we can show people that we are on their side and standing up for them. But we can only continue to do this if we peace. beat the Tories and if we win. We must pull together, we must get out there and campaign. We must listen to what ordinary people tell us they are worried about. And we must have policies that meet their needs. Only by listening and being an outward-facing party have we piece? any chance of beating the Tories. We must bring back a Labour government, a Labour government that is neither old nor new, just Labour. Alice Smart, lead city councillor and first time delegate. <laughs> Conference. Since the Tories came to power in 2010, Labour run lead city council has been hit with annual budget cuts and are about to have an extra £10 million taken from our budget, leaving us with less than a third of the government funding we had before the Tories came to power six years ago. Lead city council is doing what it can to protect frontline services but there's no denying that these draconian Tory cuts are taking us backwards and making life harder for those worse off. These cuts are a political choice and not an economic necessity, and they're certainly not over yet. What has happened in Leeds is not an isolated situation. Labour and councils across the country, but particularly in the north of England, have had their budgets slashed and the lives of those Labour seeks to represent are being directly affected. But what can Labour do about it? Sadly, there are no quick fixes to reversing these cuts while Labour is out of government. But it's clear that Labour must re-evaluate the way we see local government and the scope of potential, and the potential solutions devolution can provide to the challenges councils like Leeds are facing. At a time like this, Labour can't be seen as being afraid of devolution. Instead, this is a moment to, bold, to be bold and empower communities to shape the future that they want to see. Our party leadership and the Parliamentary Labour Party could learn a lot from Labour in power in the North. City councils like Leeds and Manchester are finding innovative ways to make social and economic process in spite of huge funding shortfalls. In spite of everything, Leeds is the UK's fastest growing economy and that isn't because of Theresa May, it's because of the Labour Council. While Labour is out of government, the party needs to empower Labour councils who are minimising the worst effects of the cuts and showing the positive difference Labour in power can make. It's vital that any devolution proposals Labour puts forward are more than just a token displacement of powers. It's crucial that any movement of power is followed by funding because ultimately you can't empower local councils if you impoverish them. The principle of devolution resonates with lots of local politicians in the North. We need local solutions to local problems, and we've known that for a long time. It's great that Westminster heavyweights like Andy Burnham and Steve Rotherham want to get stuck into running our northern cities, but it's also important to remember the likes of Judith Blake and Richard Lees, who are doing this day in, day out, and don't always get the support and recognition they deserve. <laughs> Labour must be bolder than the Tories on devolution. We need to take back the initiative on, the, on an agenda that should naturally be ours, Labour should set out a radical agenda with clear, tangible outcomes for local economies and communities. Devolution isn't just a means for helping mitigate austerity. It's also important because handing back powers to the communities that we seek to represent is intrinsic to our Labour values. Thank you, Conference. Okay, this will be the last speaker in this debate. Conference. Last but not least, um, Alex Heslop, uh, Labour Housing Group, speaking on the, uh, on the Labour debate. Um, conference. The Labour Housing Group has always been a broad church. 
open to everyone in our party, right, left and centre, who are generally interested in housing. Come and join us and get involved as we fight for our communities up and across the country. Um, I welcome Theresa's um, pledge and commitment um, to build a million new homes in the next Labour government, which we hope to see in 2020. Um, we have always believed in moving from benefits to bricks and mortar. Let's look at the statistics. You know, every one pound of new investment in, in, in housing, you get about two pounds back. It's investment, it pays off, it's common economic sense. And the first coalition government and now the Conservative government have failed to invest in housing. And we need to uh, reverse that, that change for good. Let's see new council homes as the solution and not the problem. The Conservatives have never believed in council housing. And we need to get that to, we need to change that for good. But what have they given us? Well, pay to stay, the bedroom tax. Um, let's get rid of that. We in the Labour Housing Group believe in a single rent, uh, single rent for everyone. Let's not create disincentives for hard-working people that just happen to live in social housing. Let's just change all of that. Finally, let's keep up the pressure and campaign against the pernicious housing and planning bill once and for all, if we can't achieve it throughout this Parliament, as soon as we get into power, let's just scrap it and start again. And, um, and let's just come up with some proper, effective housing policies that meet the genuine needs of all of our communities up and down the country. Thank you. I'll now ask Rachel Maskell, Shadow Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, to reply to the debate. Conference. Economic certainty and security forms the bedrock of delivering food security and a strong agricultural and fishing sector. Since the 23rd of June, we've learned that the government made no analysis of the depth of its relationship with the EU, had no understanding of the capacity needed to renegotiate hundreds of regulations protecting our food safety and wider environment, and has no plan for the future of the sector, which employs 3.9 million people and where 75% of our food exports go to the EU. A government totally irresponsible, totally reckless and totally inept. Since, we have seen nothing more than warm words and dithering. They're not a think tank or a policy forum. They're meant to be a government leading our nation. The sector needs answers now. While the government may not understand strategic business planning, the agricultural and food sectors do. Crucially, how we trade will determine if rural Britain thrives or survives. Labour will work with the food and agricultural sector to underpin trade with the right financial drivers to grow production whilst protecting our natural world. Labour will back British farming plough to plate. Ready now to revive rural communities, revive coastal communities, revive urban communities and revive our nation from the wreckage this government has created. Labour's um, Labour's ambition to revive urban communities starts with reconnecting urban to rural Britain. Not only do we want to see city farms, environment centres and schemes like Edible York in my constituency, where communities grow veg on street corners together, but ensure everyone can access the countryside. That's why Labour governments created national parks and the right to roam. With Labour, schools will take children out to get to know the wonders of the rural life and through social prescribing we'll use the environment to help improve people's health. Labour will clean our air, develop clean and renewable energy, manufacture clean transport, plant millions of trees, and we will introduce emission zones for our major towns and cities to end the invisible smog, which is killing 50,000 people a year. <laughs> Unlike the, the government, Labour will embrace the circular economy reducing consumption, recycling and regenerating energy from our waste, not turning it over to landfill. We all have a part to play in Labour's recycling revolution. We also have a poor relationship with food, when it comes from what we eat, how much it really costs to produce, how much we need, how much we waste. 
a quarter of adults are overweight or obese. Families put £470 a year of food straight into the bin. We will change that relationship with education and labelling, better health interventions and a new food framework. And this is how Labour will revive rural communities. Rural Britain is ageing fast. We need people to work the land and in food production. Labour will expose all to the opportunities of rural life in high-skilled farming jobs, technology, science and research, as well as the unbeatable privilege and yet skilled work of rearing stock and growing crops. Labour will protect rural communities by ensuring long-term settlements hit the right balance between farming and environmental measures, not segregating these agendas, but integrating them, never forgetting the smaller producers. We will defend and extend environmental protections, but we will not compromise production. And we will ensure that all the risks of food production doesn't fall on farmers. With Labour, the Grocery Code Adjudicator will have extended powers to provide protections right through the food production chain. Today, I give a clear commitment to farmers and food manufacturers. Under Labour, the workforce you have recruited, invested in and trained from the EU will have the right to stay and keep their jobs. It will give you security, it will give them security, and it will give their children security. We will also establish a new Agricultural Sector Council to underpin all issues related to employment, including wages across the sector. <laughs> Labour will revive rural communities through digitalisation, reaching all with broadband and mobile coverage so businesses are no longer restricted to urban settings and a mobile workforce can relocate. And Labour will revive rural communities by addressing the rural transport crisis, building the homes that local people need. And with better rural policing and public services, we will serve rural Britain. At, at the forefront of many of our minds, floods. I know the harm and cost that flooding brings. Hundreds of residents in, and businesses in my constituency were devastated when Storm Eva struck. Many are still recovering. We will not stand by when it comes to climate change. Labour will do everything we can to reverse the impact on the world stage and here at home. Unlike the government, we'll be getting on with implementing whole river catchment management. Farmers, residents and businesses deserve better. And while on floods, yes, the Fire and Rescue Service will have a statutory duty to deal with flooding. Re revive urban communities, revive rural communities, and the same goes to revive coastal communities. I grew up in a coastal semi-rural community, and I know the importance of fishing to local economies. Through ensuring our fish stock is sustainable and through maritime regeneration, we will secure a fair distribution of quotas to revive fishing communities. We need to harness the natural resources of our sea and coast. As an island nation, Labour will develop tidal power generation, adding this further to renewable energy. As a country, we have forgotten the wealth that living by the coast brings us. Governments have let coastal communities fade. No longer. Labour will put you back on the map again. Oh, and another community that needs Labour. Badgers. When, <laughs> when every shed of evidence says bovine TB will be beaten with better testing, vaccination, better biosecurity and animal husbandry, a government that ignores scientists, academics, its own experts, and many farmers too, and instead turns its frustration on a badger, is giving false hope. Labour will end the badger call and prioritise ending t no, bovine TB. <laughs> Animal welfare. Animal welfare is at the heart of what we all care about, whether our wildlife domestically, commercially or internationally protecting endangered species. With Labour launching our consultation on animal welfare, we want you to shape their policy for the future. But whether animals, birds or our plant life, Labour will work to ensure that our whole biodiversity system thrives again. For too long, government has made its starting point rules and regulation. Labour's starting place is people, communities and our amazing natural world. 
Labour has listened and learnt, and Labour is now the party with a fresh vision to revive our rural, coastal and urban communities. Labour now the party for environment, food and rural affairs. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Rachel. Um, we'll now take the debate on the Transport Policy Commission report, which is at pages 42 to 46 of the MPF report and the Priorities Issue document on pages 102 to 106. Our first speaker to move the report is Diana Holland. Thanks very much. It's normally when I get up to speak about women and equality that everyone leaves the room. But this time, <laughs> it's about transport. Right, Chair, conference. As co-convener of Labour's Transport Policy Commission, moving our annual report and the priority issue document, I can report that Labour's transport policy unites us all. Unlike this Tory government, we are united against rising fares, the isolation of rural communities, cuts to services and safety, and their divisive agenda of deregulation and privatisation. We know, as a Labour Party, just how important transport is to all our communities, which is why Labour opposes Tory plans to ban future municipal bus companies. and why Labour is committed to bringing our railways into public ownership. It's just too important to be left to the market alone. Transport connects us all. It's a public service we all need, a major employer vital to economic growth. We know we need a transport policy that supports public health and we need transport to be included in planning and housing developments too. We want transport to be integrated, accessible, affordable, and following the last debate as well, sustainable, for people and for freight. And all transport must be properly included. Buses as well as trains, seaports as well as airports, lorries as well as cars. And right at the heart of transport policy, where they belong, walking and cycling too. We want transport hubs that work, that join up. And we want the right decisions taken at the right level, the right people at the table, and democratic accountability too. It is not too much to ask for. It's what people want, and it's what they want to vote for. Our Policy to Commission has discussed how lack of transport leads to loneliness and isolation. We've been alerted to the need for community transport and for disability access to include passengers with learning disabilities too. We've considered innovative and imaginative transport solutions across councils in Scotland and Wales, in London and throughout Europe, and we've looked at the rest of the world. Cutting emissions, pedestrianisation and park and ride, truck stops and more. And the impact of new technologies and the EU referendum vote on transport, on the environment and on jobs. There are opportunities and there are problems. And we've learned directly from the experience of transport workers themselves. As Unite's Assistant General Secretary for a quarter of a million transport workers and many of you here in the room across our movement, I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to all transport workers for the vital work that they do. So in, in closing, I also want to thank everyone who's made submissions. Commission members, our co-conveners, Andy MacDonald and Lillian Greenwood, and Adam Scott, our policy officer. This report is just a start. Transport can really make a difference for the better. Let's make sure Labour transport policy does just that. I move. Thank you.
Thanks, Diana. Can I see all of those that want to talk in the debate, please? Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. Um, and there is, yeah, the guy there, yeah. Are there any women that want to speak in the debate? Um, yeah, and there's um, yeah, the woman there in the white shirt there. Yeah. Okay. I, I will take more contributions. We'll just call up these three for, for now. Chair Conference, Tosh MacDonald from Aslef, rising to support Labour Party's policy on transport, Labour Party's policy on public ownership of the railways. And let's see a really publicly owned, publicly accountable transport policy, transport networks throughout Britain, be it road, be it rail. Let's see municipal bus companies being run. Let's have no more deregulation. Let's see it being run together with rail. Now, I have to be careful what I say, not because I'm scared of being purged, but because Southern <laughs> have a couple of injunctions out against Aslef. Rather than trying to sit down and discuss and talk about the way forward in our industry, they decided to take our sister unions on industrially and take Aslef on in the courts. Well, I tell you, we do stand side by side by our colleagues in other grades, in other unions, being forced out of the industry. We don't believe driver-only operation is the way forward for the industry. We don't believe closing booking offices and making people in booking offices, platform staff, redundant is the way forward for the industry. It's long been the policy of this great party at many conferences about public ownership of the rail network. We have a leadership now who believe in public ownership of the rail network. And we know that it works. We saw five years of East Coast in public ownership after National Express and before them, sea containers in the guise of GNER failed to run it privately. They couldn't make enough profit but in five years as East Coast, we made a billion pound back for the Exchequer, reinvested 40 million pound into East Coast. That works. Now, you know, I'm employed by Northern Rail, one of the big franchises in the North. And a strange thing happened to me on the 1st of April at two o'clock in the morning. I went from being employed by the Dutch State Railway to being employed by the German State Railway. <laughs> the Dutch State Railway sent me a pen through the post with a name on it, saying thank you for the 12 years of blood, sweat and toil that you've given them. If you believe that, you'll believe anything. <laughs> the German State Railway sent me a lanyard, welcomed me to work for them. So when I were on a train, people would know who I belong to. If I'm near a train, you'll see me with an Aslef lanyard on. That's who I belong to. Now, one thing I will say, we've got the policy, we've won the argument on public ownership on the passenger side. We need to win that argument also on the freight sector in transport. We've seen with the doubling of tax on coal, the end of coal being moved and used around the country. We've seen train drivers made redundant for the first time since British Rail days. The German State Railway, one of the big owners of Britain's British freight now, when the downturn came in 2008, moved freight drivers into the passenger sector because they could. The same company, Deutsche Bahn, made drivers surplus freight drivers in Britain because it weren't all one railway. So let's not just see publicly owned railways, let's see a publicly owned railway that works together in conjunction. Freight, passenger, let's do it all together. You know, 
And when we have a publicly owned railway, publicly owned buses, when we have a transport system integrated that we can all be proud of, let's let pensioners travel free. Let's let disabled people travel free, like the Freedom Riders in South Yorkshire are fighting for. But you know, let's let children travel free as well, right across the age spectrum. Publicly owned transport is the way forward. Publicly owned, publicly, ours, nationalised. It's not a dirty word. It works, and I'd like to see it working for the utilities as well. Thank you. Support, comrades. I was just going to come up and say, I move. <laughs> Chair Conference, James Mitchell, Unite the Union, speaking on the report in respect of issues on buses. I am a bus worker and I work in London and I'm speaking on the bus service bill today. Buses are the most frequently used and most dramatic form of public transport, depending on by all parts of society, including young, and elderly. They are a lifeline to our communities. The Bus Service Bill attempts to re-regulate the bus market, which we do welcome. Franchising would allow some local transport authorities to determine, for example, the frequency and standard of service and fares. But we have concerns. As a bus worker myself, I know firsthand the disaster of privatisation and deregulation in the bus industry. Polls show, as a majority of the British public think local authorities should be allowed to set up new public bus companies. Research finds we should have save 506 million a year by bringing buses outside London into public ownership. Yet, the Bus Service Bill includes a clause that would ban councils in England from setting up new municipal bus companies. That clause should be removed, and we welcome Labour's commitment to opposing it. If the government is generally interested in local authorities being able to meet locals', locals needs, we believe manipulation needs to be available to all local authorities. But there are other changes concerning bus workers that should be made in the bill. First, trade unions should be included as statutory consultees as workers' representatives. <laughs> unions denied in the bus industry or density in the, bus unit, in the bus industry is amongst the highest in the economy. Bus workers deserve to be represented as well as the bus passengers who have already been given statutory consultee status. Secondly, the bill doesn't appear to offer protection for new employees who are not covered by the 2P pension protection in the bill. This could lead to operators bidding for contracts and driving down costs by cutting terms and conditions for further employees with risks to further service delivery. Unite members, and we represent 90,000 bus workers, have been in the forefront of trying to repair the damage caused by bus deregulation. We need Labour to be in the forefront of challenging any threats to bus services in the bus service bill. And we need a Labour government to deliver a strong, integrated and sustainable transport strategy that recognises the importance of transport and the value of transport workers to society, to the economy and to the environment. Because let's make one thing clear. This country can't move without us. I move.
I'm going to take three more speakers. Yeah, there's a woman there with a pink CAC report. Um, there's a guy there with a red bag. Um, and there is a woman there with a black jacket on. Right. Good afternoon, delegates. Have you noticed I don't have a script in front of me? Because what I know and what I have is up here and in here. I three, fit three categories that's been debated today. I'm a woman, I'm a pensioner, and I'm disabled. And I've had bad experience for many years in all three categories. As a woman delegate yesterday at the conference, hearing some of the horrendous stories that women have had to face and still facing, to problems with disabled people having problems today, including myself, um, also to do with transport. Uh, as a councillor, being elected this year, now on my 18th year as a councillor for my borough, um, Rossdale Borough Council has had, thank you, Rossdale Borough Council has had many problems within the past because it was run by the Lib Dems for many years with the Smith Brothers. I'd just like to say today that over the last two years we've really worked hard and we now have 48 Labour councillors out of 60. Um, we are very proud of that. My issues today, uh, I wasn't going to speak, but I do believe we have still lots of problems for disabled people in conference, within the two venues, but also transport-wise. I would have expected, having to come such a long way to get to a conference, they might have even arranged transport from the main road for those that do not have wheelchairs. I've also found, because I am not in a wheelchair, I have been classed as an able-bodied person today, and I, I am so angry about it. So we need to get our act together right first before we can put the rights out there. And I believe there's only one party that can actually do that, and it is Labour. And I'm so glad that we are bringing a lot of our transport back in-house, because that's where it needs to be all along. Thank you. Good afternoon, Conference. I'm Councillor Jonathan Hawkes. I'm leader of the Labour Group in Dartford, Kent. Conference, thousands of people in my town and across Kent are currently experiencing the consequences of years of Tory underinvestment in our road networks and in public transport. The Tories promised to deliver an integrated transport plan. Conference, they have failed to deliver on that promise. In my town of Dartford, we experience horrendous traffic gridlock on almost a daily basis. Now, this isn't simply an inconvenience. The impact of years of stationary traffic means that Dartford has some of the, some of the poorest air quality in Kent, and we suffer from higher instances of lung cancer and asthma because of transport-related air pollution. Conference, that is a disgrace, and residents should not have to put up with it. There's an e economic impact, too. When people are sitting in their cars in traffic jams instead of getting to work or instead of getting to appointments or instead of making deliveries, the negative impact on our local economy is huge. We simply cannot afford to have any more years of gridlock. So like the rest of the country, we need to get Dartford moving, but the Tories are no help. They've differed, they've delayed on a decision on a new Lower Thames crossing and they failed to deliver vital improvements to the strategic road network. They keep on announcing them, sure, but they don't actually get done. And right now, with a 37% cut in the Department of Transport budget and council finances being slashed, residents in Dartford are losing faith that they ever will. It's up to Labour to show that we can get our towns and cities moving again. We need additional investment and greater devolution to local authorities so we can deliver the improvements to our road network that we desperately need. If we have to wait for Chris Grayling to do it, we'll be waiting forever. And the government needs to make a decision now on a new Lower Thames crossing. People in Dartford have been waiting three years for a decision and we can't afford to wait any longer. Labour councils can and are delivering a truly integrated approach to transport, bringing together investment in our roads, 
renewed bus services that operate in the interest of people who use them, as well as well-maintained cycle routes that actually go to places where you might want to go. Government should learn from local government and adopt this approach across the country. Conference, this is why we need to win power back at local level and national level, so we can deliver the investment and the changes we need to see, and we can truly get Britain moving again. Thank you. Chair Conference, Mary Sitole from TSSA, first time delegate. Transport, transport keeps the country moving and the business is functioning. We welcome London, Labour's London Mayor Sadiq Khan's decision to review the closure of ticket offices on London Underground. People want a safe and reliable staffed rail and underground system. But conference, Southern, a greedy privateer, already mentioned by Tosh, intends to do the opposite. As Sadiq realizes the folly, Southern intends to make the same mistakes. Machines cannot replace the skills and knowledge that I and my colleagues have. It discriminates against the disabled and the elderly to replace us with machines. They do not offer the cheapest fares. Smart cards are being used to undermine our jobs, denying, the, denying us the technology to compete. Please, conference, I am proud to serve. Help me continue to do this in, in my job. Please support. Um, I'll just call another round of um, speakers. Yeah, there's a woman over there waving a red scarf. Um, there is, yeah, there's a woman with a lightsaber. <laughs> Great prop. Um, and there's um, a guy with a red folder. Okay, conference chair, um, I want to um, talk about why climate change uh, should be at the heart of development of transport strategy. And I, I, I'm very pleased that climate change has, has been referred to in other debates, and I'm sure we're going to hear it again during this conference. But I want to focus on transport. Uh, and maybe I can ask you to indulge me just a wee bit while I recap why um, our focus on transport climate change is important. Um, the Paris Climate Change Accord has set a target of 1.5 degrees limit uh, with a maximum of 2 degrees to, to, um, to global temperature in, uh, uh, increases. Um, what, what, uh, if, we, if, we, if we go beyond that and we carry on with um, our, our, our current uh, trajectory, we, we hit 4%. And what's really worrying is what that will mean. Um, if, we, if we don't do anything we, and we hit 4%, the Netherlands, most, most uh, island nations of this world will be wiped out. No, the Netherlands will disappear and, and the boundary of the UK will be at Cambridge. Um, if we don't do anything, it won't be Britannia ruling the waves, but the waves ruling Britannia. So this is important. Um, so uh, Cameron has signed up to 80% uh, reductions uh, in CO2 by the UK by 2050. I've heard that referred to as sanctimonious posturing, and, and I think that's an, a very good definition of it. Um, last week, um, uh, there was, there was a, a report in the press uh, of some new scientific e evidence showing that uh, the Greenland uh, permafrost and the Antarctic, Antarctic ice ledge are beginning to melt with current climate change to a, to a point where they're likely to tip over and, and be ir ir irrecoverable. Um, a second study also produced last week by a company, an organization called Oil Change International identified that the amount of coal, oil and gas we already have the ability to take out of the ground 
will actually bring us to that 1.5 and 2% target without any more development. This is, this is a wake-up call. So, why transport? Transport because transport accounts for 25% of those emissions and it's the biggest increasing area. So it's the area that is going to grow most. Um, we have in this country uh, the EU, tar EU set target of um, cutting um, greenhouse emissions, sorry, increasing the use of renewable f uh, energy 15% by, by 2020. That's 10% for transport. So this is 2020, four years away. We have actually now this year reached four and a quarter percent, which is less than last year, i.e. the Tory government are going backwards. And um, they go, they're going backwards because of a, you know, the sanctimonious posturing uh, around transport policy. There are 38 million vehicles on the roads in this country, 31 million cars. Um, 60 percent of those cars are petrol driven, 38 diesel, you work out what the rest is. Two million cars uh, registered last year, about 1% of the, all those vehicles, electrical vehicles. On the roads, we have less than one-fifth of 1% 1 of electrical vehicles. So we need to do something to actually, as part of our transport policy, move on electrification. Buses, 160,000, 170,000 buses and coaches on the road. Okay, so the, the, the privatised bus companies are making a real gesture to increase the electrification. Are they? Finally, rail, the railways. Um, we have a £4.2 billion programme of electrification called a halt to last year because they were running out of money. The issue is, is that all that cost will be transferred to ticket and season prices. We need a real focus on a proper strategy for electrification right across the transport sector wind up now, please. with proper investment. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Waida Foreman, Harlow CLP. Um, in Harlow, it's sunny Harlow in Essex, we always have problem with traffic because the way the town was built, it was supposed to be dual carriageway, but it's not. So let's try and save money. So everywhere we have is just chocker with cars. And we have private company who provide the bus service but unfortunately, the bus service is not providing a service. They're doing it for profit. So they don't actually care whether we get a bus service to get one place to another. I'm a nurse in the hospital in Harlow, and we have problem parking. Just because the public transport is so bad, everybody try and use their car. Those who don't have a car, well, they can't do anything and either they're late or they can't get to work, can't get anywhere. Bus service is horrendous. A lot of elderly people are being isolated. They can't even rely on the public transport to get anywhere. In the council, we've got a bus forum, which we actually try and get the public to explain, you know, why we need to get to nationalize the, the bus service but unfortunately a lot of people try not to use the word nationalize because it's like a swearing word uh, they're scared i did and one of the tory councillors told me to shut up because i'm a stupid woman but don't worry i told him where to go So it's, it's very vital to actually get uh, nationalising the uh, public transport, especially now that we all actually, we've been told by the government we need to build more houses to expand our town. But we really need to look at public transport because the road is atrocious. And also with the environment, asthma, and kids, lots of kids come in the hospital being asthmatic, and it's just 
you know, we just really need to nationalise it. So I'm glad Labour Party, especially Jeremy Corbyn, he thinks like I do, actually, because I'm always, you know, on the kind of doing what he says and he does what I say. So, so you know, we need to support this and try our best to fight and get to nationalise the public transport. It's a service, it's not for profit. Thank you. My name is Phoebe Kemp, I'm from South West Wiltshire CLP and I'm a first time delegate. I would like to speak to you about the importance of accessibility in our transport system. Wheelchair access and access for other disabled people is still way below par. Um, from bus services that still don't have ramps, um, to the fact that if you want to go on a train journey you have to book 24 hours in advance. Um, I have numerous experience of this myself. I've been stranded on trains probably about five times because there was nobody there to meet me at the other end with a ramp. I had once had to wait for six buses outside Liverpool Street Station because they wouldn't pull up to the curb because it was too steep. And probably at least once a week I come across people parking in blue badge bays when they do not have a blue badge. We really, really need to prioritise access because disabled people are so excluded from society and without being able to get places, it makes it even more so. The technology is there and exists on some systems. We just need to catch up. Thank you. I'm just gonna take another round of three questions. Speakers. Uh, speakers. Can you indicate if you want to speak? Okay, so this will. Um, yep, yeah, there's a there's a there's a guy there holding up um, a pen. Um, and yep, yeah, someone uh, with a red um, booklet there. Um, and there's uh, someone there in, in a jacket. But that will be the last round of um, speakers in this debate. Okay. Hi there, my name's Tom. I'm a first-time delegate, first-time visitor and first-time speaker. So I <laughs> apologise if I sound a bit nervous. I come from a small little town called Bracknell. And we had a very special event where we had Professor Danny Dawling and someone called John McDonald. I don't know who he is, so come down. Um, Danny Dorning is a geographer, but he also specialises in particular inequality. And the reason why I want to broaden this up, because he he's raised a, a specific issue on transport, and in particular, cars. So, in some areas, it is normal for the parents of children aged under five not to have a car. Most under fives live in homes with no access to a car in their areas, finding it hard for them to go to the shops, families and doctors. In comparison, huge numbers of neighbourhoods, most under fives, live in households with access to two or more cars. When they are taken to the shops, the issue is whether to go in mum's car, dad's car or the people carrier. Um, not many um, bags and not knowing how many bags they can fit. Sorry, not how many bags can be carried under the buggy. We have more than enough cars to give some up and simultaneously for every family with children that need to have one. Car drivers are the most effective killers of our children in, in Britain. More cars driven by parents who don't need one, need one. and a far fewer driven by the most of other groups would, it, would make us all safer. 
conference, I just want to go and bring the highlight of that cars has the biggest, biggest show of inequality in today. And I want to see that Labour bring a, possibly a better incentive for people who are in rural areas, for single parents, single mums, who haven't got the access to a car, who hasn't got an access to, um, access to a car to be able to go and transport, to go and take it to the hospital in Neesby, compared to some people who've got three or four cars in some areas. So I would love to go and see the better in, in inspiration of car um, ownership is for more disabled and more so more people who really crucially need it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, Tom Turner, East Surrey, CLP. I wasn't planning on saying anything, but neither was anyone else apparently, so I thought I might as well give it a go. <laughs> I come from a small town called Hawley next to Gatwick Airport. Um, I'm not going to talk about planes, I'm going to talk about trains. Um, in my hometown there's no post-16 provision for education, so we all have to travel elsewhere, um, nearby towns both in county and out of county for our post-16 provision. And most many of us rely on trains, particularly Southern Rail. Um, whilst I was at, I'm at university now, but whilst I was at Sixth Form College, I um, missed the beginnings of lessons. Um, I've had friends who've missed their exams. On multiple occasions, I've had to fork out for a taxi because the trains weren't there, and that was before the current dispute. Um, since the dispute, I've um, witnessed a situation where it's seemingly going to be much more difficult um, for people in my town to commute to these excellent educational institutions elsewhere with no local alternative. People, are going to, people increasingly, as the trains become unreliable, are having to, go to pay more for alternatives to make sure they get to college on time more frequently. That's just young people. When, it gets, when you get to older people, you've got um, commuting workers. Um, it's a very much a commuter town where I live. People travel often to London to work. In the mornings, their lives are made miserable as they turn up to work late again. They've already been warned about punctuality. They don't know how long they're going to be able to keep their jobs living where they currently do. And in the evenings, if delayed trains mean that they'll often miss their children at home, not ever ha being able to have a family life anymore having that completely undermined. And when it comes to the current dispute, um, I have to ask myself, do I trust Southern Rail, who, whose service has been appalling and their planning has been awful in, in all this beforehand, that they are right when they say that it's going to be completely safe to take the, the role of closing doors away from conductors? And do I trust the local Tory MPs who say, who simply back up the pl um, plans that in the name of making sure that private businesses work because wouldn't it be a shame if it turned out that actually nationalisation was the best option for them? Or do I trust a dri train driver I met down the pub who tells me that if you have a screen the size of a credit card with 12 mini little screens on them um, that display you the doors, that it's quite hard to see and that it's very easy to miss something and hence not very safe. Private provision of the, rail, of the rail service where I live has not worked. Even the, most of the Tories I know in the area, on a per, who I have as friends, agree that it doesn't work. So not, I, I'm not friends with them because they're Tories, don't worry. Um, even they agree that nationalisation would be a good idea. I think it's about time that we seriously looked into it. If not nationally, then at least in those areas where private rail provision has already, beyond dispute, failed. Wind up now. I was about to, yeah. Thank you. So <laughs> I'm very happy that we're supporting nationalisation of the railways. Thank you. This is the last speaker now in this debate.
Comrades, I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> Callum Watts from Lincoln CLP. One of the first things I learned in politics and about economics was about markets. When you go into a supermarket and you see two identical products, you pick the one that is cheaper. And if you see the one which is of a slightly better quality, perhaps you have to weigh up whether you're willing to pay more for it. But when you're standing on a train platform and a train comes along, you don't go, I don't want that one, I'll get the next one, because you don't like the colour of the seating, for example. It's a false economy. It's a racket. All of the money from your tickets is going into the pockets of private investors and not being invested in the railway. And we are right to support nationalisation on that basis. For conference, we do have to think deeply about it as well. I come from uh, the city of Lincoln, which is plagued uh, by daily uh, freight rail traffic. And uh, we actually had a major transport uh, hub uh, project being built in the city that had to be decoupled from a rail bridge because network rail took so long to build one single uh, footbridge over the railway further down the line. Uh, that it's still being built nearly two months after it first opened. So we need to think not just about nationalisation, but how we democratise our public transport, how we bring more power to municipalities, to people in local areas over their own bus and rail services. So, uh, Corrines, thank you for the opportunity to speak here, and we should bear that in mind in future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Andy MacDonald, Shadow Secretary of State for Transport, will now reply to the debate. Conference, it's an honour to serve our great party and be here today to talk to you about Labour's transport policy. And I'd like to start by paying tribute to all of those in our party who do so much to improve transport in the UK. Our members who through the Transport Policy Commission are helping to shape and inform our policies from the grassroots up. Our colleagues in local government who continue to deliver transport services in the face of an onslaught against their budgets, showing that labour values are essential in protecting and transforming our communities. From Mersey Travel here in this great city of Liverpool to TfL and to Sadiq Khan, who's already done more on Transport for Londoners in a few months than his predecessor managed in eight years. And of course, of course colleagues in Parliament, both in uh, the House of Commons and the Lords, are holding the government to account, making invaluable contributions from both the front and back benches. And it's when we stand together across our great movement that we win the ability to transform for the better the country we love. And conference, stand together we must because the challenges facing the nation are huge and only a Labour government will ever address them. Comrades, we need to have an understanding and an agreement about what transport is for. Public transport has become increasingly detached from the concept of public service. Too often, it's seen as a series of opportunities to profit from an essential service that no government can let fail. Colleagues, I fundamentally challenge that entire premise. Transport surely has to be about the safe and efficient transport of people and goods, and at its heart, our transport systems should have fairness, value for money, quality and reliability of service, and crucially, conference, accessibility for all. Sadly, those imperatives in the drive for profits and dividends are all too often absent. And what do we see instead? Infrastructure work repeatedly delayed and over budget. Unaffordable fares with the cost of bus and rail tickets rising way above inflation, deliberately complex and punitive fare structures. 
over 2,400 local authorities supported bus routes withdrawn or downgraded. And a third of our local roads in need of urgent attention, yet the government cuts the funds to fix them and fails to shift more freight from road to rail. At a time when we need to be encouraging people to take up environmentally friendly modes of transport, funding for cyclists is set to plummet by 70%. And despite the fact that so many people with disabilities rely on public transport, access for all budget has been slashed by 40%. And it's no surprise that under this chaotic Tory government, HS2's prospects for improving connections between the North and the South seem more distant than ever. And we must be clear that devolution of rail services in England is not about devolving cuts or at the expense of an integrated national network which Labour believes should be publicly owned. Conference, those who we seek to represent deserve better and we, the Labour Party, must provide the alternative this country needs. Following the vote to leave the EU, we need extra airport capacity more than ever, yet the government's dithering and internal bickering is costing our economy millions upon millions of pounds. Aviation and railways attract a great deal of attention, but it's Britain's buses, which are the most used form of public transport, with over four and a half billion journeys made last year. But the Conservatives have cut the grant for bus services by 20%, and since deregulation in the 80s, commercial bus providers have no incentives to provide these services, often to more isolated communities that, while socially vital, are dismissed as commercially unprofitable. And the bus, bus, the bus services bill, as we've heard, will soon have its second reading in the House of Commons. And I must pay tribute to my friend and colleague, Daniel Zeichner, who's done sterling work uh, along with colleagues in the Lords. And, and I think we agree that there's much that we can support in the bill. We want local communities to have uh, control over their bus services, but we want to ensure that every area that wants to has the power over running their bus services, not just mayoral combined authorities. We'll also be fighting the proposal to ban English local authorities from forming municipal bus companies, which have proved so very successful. And as for our railways, yeah, we look at southern trains, officially the country's worst rail service, but a nice little earner for Go Ahead Group who registered a 90, 99 million pound profit last year, not a bad one at all, but thousands of trains cancelled or delayed with the approval of Tory ministers, passengers suffering unbearable overcrowding, parents having to say goodnight to their children by phone from a train carriage, and people losing their jobs, unable to arrive at work on time. And is the company stripped of the contract? No, it gets total support of the government to hack away at services and jobs and the benefit of £20 million more taxpayers' money for good measure. They won't be stripped of the contract no matter how bad the services get because the government is more interested in defending train companies than defending passengers, the taxpayers and their staff. And they have the nerve to call us ideological. As East Coast showed us, we can have a successful run, railway run in the public sector. East Coast placed its interstate ownership after the private operator walked away. Over a billion pounds to the Treasury, it kept fares down, had record passenger satisfaction and engaged the workforce with unparalleled success before the line was reprivatised. What we have now is a government clinging to a failed model for purely ideological reasons and passengers and taxpayers are being made to pay an ever-increasing price. We are clear about this. We'll put an end to Britain's rip-off railways. So as contracts expire, the routes will return to public ownership so the profits can be reinvested to improve services and hold fares down. Because passengers, not profit, 
should be at the heart of Britain's railways. Let us have the same confidence as other countries like the Netherlands, Germany and France. Labour will take back control of our railways. Conference, there's much to do across the entire transport sector. So let us shape our transport networks and, ser and services and secure a genuinely integrated, high quality, socially just, greener and cleaner transport system that brings together families and, and brings together friends and meets the needs of business. The transport system under Labour would not only bring economic growth and development, but would improve social mobility and cohesion for the benefit of all our people. Only a Labour government can make this happen. Let's get to it. Thanks, Andy. And we'll take the votes on these debates at the end of the session. We will now move on to the report from Wales. In May, we faced tough elections in Wales with major challenges from Ply Cymru, UKIP, as well as the Conservatives. It was a hard fought campaign, but against many expectations, Labour won the elections. So I'm delighted to welcome the First Minister of Wales, Carwin Jones. Well, thank you, Conference, and thank you for that welcome. I hope it's just the same when I finished speaking as when I started. But to embrace her, Mary Vodma, Gidachi Gid in my talk, and again, have that in. It's a great pleasure to be with you all again in this conference. I'd like to begin by offering my congratulations to Jeremy on his win. Jeremy, you have shown both dignity and determination in recent weeks, and I look forward to working with you now to rebuild Labour into a winning machine. Commiserations as well to my friend Owen Smith, who fought a campaign the only way he knows how, with tenacity and with good humour. I want to say as well a big thank you to Paul Flynn, who has recently found himself doing about half a dozen jobs. None more important than Shadow Secretary of State for Wales as the current Wales Bill passes through Parliament. But it's great to be here in Liverpool, of course, a city with such a strong Labour heritage and deep Welsh links. Merseyside was, at one time, home to a thriving Welsh-speaking community. It hosted the Eisteddfod on no fewer than three occasions, and it was in Birkenhead that one of our finest poets, Heath Wynne, famously won the Bardic Chair just six weeks after being killed in action in World War I. In the 19th century here, one in ten people were of Welsh origin, the cultural, sporting, and social links with the north of Wales have always been incredibly close. And today, of course, you can stand on the South Parade in West Kirby, looking south, and you can see what a truly great football nation looks like. <laughs> we waited more than 50 years, you can give us that at least. But it isn't just on the football pitch, of course, where we're moving forward. With the promise of a devolution package to the northwest of England, Welsh Labour stands ready to work with leaders in the region to build on the links that already exist and to cooperate and innovate our way to stronger growth and better opportunities for our communities. On Tuesday this week, I launched the Welsh Labour Programme for Government. I was able to do that because in May of this year, Welsh Labour won the Assembly election in Wales. We outperformed expectations. We defied the prediction that this would be a change election in Wales. And in every single Labour Tory marginal, we came out on top. And that includes seats like the Gower and the Vale of Cloyd that went Tory only last year. Bellwether seats like Cardiff North and the Vale of Glamorgan, both of which now have a Tory MP, but a Labour AM and a Labour Council. 
And that was done through the hard work of all our activists in Wales. Thank you for what you did. But you know, conference, we need to constantly remind ourselves of what Labour being in government actually means. That's our historic mission. And that's the journey that Hardy started and that every Labour leader since must try to advance. How was it that Bevan finished his great quote, the language of priorities is the religion of socialism? Well, he finished it with these words, only by the possession of power can you get the priorities correct. And our manifesto was based on a simple premise, that at every step in a person's life, when they needed most support, those would be labour priority areas for investment over the next five years. So for our schools, an additional £100 million to improve standards. For those looking to get into good quality work, 100,000 all-age quality apprenticeships. For working parents, 30 hours of free childcare Crucially, for 48 weeks of the year, reflecting the reality of family pressures. For businesses, we're developing a new permanent rate relief scheme to give them stability and the support that they need to thrive and take more people on. If you fall ill, there's a new treatment fund coming in that means patients with any life-threatening disease can access new medicines and treatments. For the elderly, a doubling of the capital limit for those who need to go into care. They worked hard for that money and they should get to keep more of it. <laughs> We're going to equip our country for the future. Digital skills now being embedded in the classroom. A new Welsh Development Bank and a new way of supporting creative industry. And we've said we're going to honour our manifesto commitments despite the uncertainty caused by Brexit. If that vote taught us anything, it's that people won't stand for it when they feel disconnected from their politics and from their politicians. In May, we won in Wales because we could show that we kept our promises and that we had a coherent vision for the future. And my priorities have been very clear in the wake of the referendum. We have to retain unfettered access to the single market. Anything else will be a massive barrier for trade in Wales. And I believe that each of the four parliaments in the UK should vote to ratify any final deal to ensure we progress as one and to show that our concerns have been acted on. Conference, many of us heard the Brexiteers say throughout that referendum campaign that Wales would not lose a penny, not lose a penny, their words, of regional aid funding as a result of Brexit. And I make no apology for holding the Brexiteers to account on that score. On the question of free movement, we can't ignore the message that we heard on the doorsteps. It is a very real concern for many working class communities and we have to develop a response that's fair, proportionate and also, of course, speaks to our values as an internationalist party. But more than anything, the challenge for me, for Sadiq and for council leaders across the country is to keep on delivering on what we promise. That's the way we win people back. Remind them that with power, Labour can act on their priorities. And conference, because we have a Welsh Labour government, we don't have to just campaign against the Trade Union Act we are going to legislate to repeal crucial sections of that unfair law. And conference will go further. By working with our trades union colleagues, we'll also bring forward proposals to prevent the use of agency workers to undermine strike action in the public sector. Now, conference, we didn't arrive at these key promises by using a few focus groups or internal meetings. No, we went out to the country after the May 2015 defeat, and we talked to people about what we could do better, what we were getting wrong, about their hopes and their fears, and we started that long journey back. 
And I've been very clear about that. No matter how good the result was in the Assembly, for us in Welsh Labour, it was a starting point on a fresh journey, not an end in itself. We need to lift our share of the vote, and we need to lift the sights of this party back to what matters. Conference, when we launched our programme for government, both the CBI and the TUC could see how we had reflected their priorities. We're not playing a zero-sum game here between capital and communities. Massive infrastructure investment will get Wales moving. It'll boost our economy. It'll bring better jobs closer to home for Welsh communities. Conference, unemployment today in Wales stands at 4.1%. That's a full percentage point lower than the UK average. Lower than Scotland, lower than London. Wales has never bounced back quicker from a recession, and why? Because in the 1930s and 1980s, Wales didn't have a devolved Welsh Labour government fighting for our interests. And we know this isn't the whole picture. We don't just want jobs, we want better jobs. And as Yvette Cooper has written about so passionately and persuasively, it's down to Labour to recognise the changing patterns of work, the challenges and opportunities of new technologies, and the insecurity the insecurity that stalks too many working lives. And these are lessons that are not lost on us in Wales. And we will shortly begin a deep and thorough investigation into the changing nature of work to make sure we keep pace with the new challenges. Better schooling, better standards, better skills. These don't just lead to a better economy, they lead to a better country and a better future. And because we believe that the future belongs to all our children, not just the lucky ones in better off areas. Incidentally, there'll be no grammar schools in Wales, just to get that clear now. <laughs> Tomorrow, we will launch a new universal child health programme to ensure that every child gets excellent, consistent health services across Wales. And at the heart of that approach will be better access to preventative and early intervention measures such as screening and development checks, a new front in our battle to end health inequality in Wales. The conference to deliver more of these kinds of changes, the country needs Labour to get back on its feet now more than ever. And a starting point for us must be to regain our dignity in the way we speak to one another and in the way that we speak to the world. It wasn't that long ago that the party's priority was anti-poverty policies, but now we're commissioning reports on anti-Semitism. How did that happen in our own party? We must ask that question. <laughs> Conference, we have no hope of creating an open, tolerant country if we can't do the same for our own party. If we really want to shape what post-Brexit Britain looks like, we have to start treating one another with respect. That's hugely important. Now, I started my speech today talking about one of our great poets, Heath Wynne. He started his most famous poem on the Great War with these words, Gwai viva me men oi smurdreng. And you will know that that means in English, bitter to live in times like these. None of us, none of us want to live through any more bitter days for this great party. The only threat we should present is to the Tories and their government. The country needs the Labour Party, but we don't have a God-given right to exist. It's time for us to focus on the things that really matter. And as Bevan said, only the successful pursuit of power can truly give you that focus. Conference, Wales has a Labour government. Britain needs a Labour government. Let's leave here united and deliver that government, because we know by delivering that government, we deliver fairness, justice and opportunity for that people. Let's go out there, win the election and do it for them. Thanks very much, Carwin, for that absolutely fantastic speech. Um, I 
I'm now pleased to ask Dave Anderson to uh, address us uh, and present the Northern Ireland report. Right, oh. <laughs> Comrades, I'm delighted to be here in Liverpool with my shot of Northern Ireland team, Stephen Pound, who's sitting over there, Tommy McAvoy and Joe Ruth Cummins. They're a team of talent and experience. I have every confidence in their ability to help me, to help you, to make Northern Ireland a better place. And I speak for the entire Labour team in thanking Vernon Corker for the great work he did in Northern Ireland. We in Labour can take great pride in the work that we did in building peace, stability and prosperity in Northern Ireland. The Northern Ireland we all know has come a long way since the 1990s when I was first involved with the trade union movement when we worked together and we worked hard to help deliver the peace process and working with this party we coined the phrase we are a non-partisan agent of change and that's the phrase that has and will guide my work in Northern Ireland. Make no mistake comrades, our party, indeed our whole movement, transform the lives of people on both sides of the Irish Sea in the moves to peace. And we must never forget that, we must never stop reminding our opponents of that. And the role played by great women like Mo Molum at the national level, <laughs> Hillary Clinton at the international level, and Inez McCormack, the trade young leader in Northern Ireland, it was a model of how to engage and how to convince people to move back from the brink. It was absolutely no overstatement last week when at the TUC Congress in Brighton, Peter Bunton, who is the General Secretary of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, said, the trade unions in Ireland prevented the troubles turning into an all-out civil war, and we should be proud of that. He was absolutely right. And it's that legacy that we've inherited and we have to live up to it today. We have to get back to what we do best and make the moral case for social justice. And if we get that right, we can start turning back the tide in Northern Ireland, the tide of insecure work, of high unemployment, of an education system failing far too many young people, and of the stark reality that since 1998, more people have died from suicide than were killed through the years of the Troubles. When I heard that last week, comrades, I had to stop and think, is this really true? And the sad reality, it is true. And it's true, not just in Northern Ireland, but across our whole country. And it's people like us who will reverse that trend. Now, I don't want to paint a picture of despair completely in Northern Ireland. It's a great place to live and work, and it's people are the most honest and genuine on earth. But they are, like us, shaped by their history, and we have to accept that and work with that. We have to show much more understanding and empathy than was seen in the Cameron years, where he's more interested in getting back to play tennis with Boris than sitting down and showing the people in Northern Ireland he genuinely cared about their future. A child born in 1998, the year the Good Friday Agreement was agreed by people on both sides of the border, that child would now be 18 years old. Now, these children of what the time we call the peace generation and the institutions that have brought the peace are now reaching adulthood. Young people in Northern Ireland have lived a life unlike that of their parents' generation. They have experienced peace, but they've still not fully benefited from the peace dividend. We need to ensure that young people in Northern Ireland are equipped with the skills needed to get on in a modern economy. In recent years, we've seen 30 per cent of job vacancies remain unfilled due to skill shortages, and this is most prevalent in Northern Ireland's largest and most successful companies. It's a disgrace that 20 per cent of our young children leave in school without being able to read or write properly. And it's intolerable that in an education system where all that seems to matter is getting children through tests and exams, we have a situation where children's access to specialist education is rationed by the sparsity of educational psychologists. It's got to change, comrades. We have to fight to ensure we build up a skills base right across Northern Ireland. 
Skills training must help those from all communities and backgrounds to aim to help those the system has failed for far too long. Young men and women from the Shanklin and the Falls, from the Bogside and the Fountain, we have to help all in Northern Ireland and not just the little few, and in particular comrades. We have to find a way to deliver a better life for the working class Protestants in Northern Ireland who were left completely adrift by political elites who have no idea what their lives are like on the ground, the tough lives these people are living, and they have to vote for people who have no recognition of what they're going through. Conference, if Northern Ireland is to move forward, the government in Westminster must be there to support when needed. The British government, government is a core guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement, along with the Irish government, have an important role still in supporting Northern Ireland to push the peace process further. And now we have to work through the other challenge, that we've got to get the best possible deal for Northern Ireland as we prepare to leave the European Union. And make no mistake, comrades, Cameron's Northern Ireland Secretary of State in Northern Ireland, both of whom pushed hard for Brexit, were hard-right ideologues, and their dogmatic approach has led to this. They've put the border at risk. They've severely damaged the economy of our closest and oldest neighbour and partner in peace. And they've given sustenance to those who are determined to break the United Kingdom apart. Getting this under control is the number one priority for us in this party as regards Ireland. And it is no easy task that faces us and people right across the island of Ireland. The whole of the peace process has been hugely underpinned by the European Union in a multitude of ways, most of which it would appear the Tories seem completely oblivious of. The most obvious issue is whether or not we have to really seriously look at going back to border points where we have checkpoints and passport controls on the border. What a negative view that would be. But at least it's difficult when you go over there and speak to the people on the ground is to quantify the day-to-day -day issues of people that affect them in their lives, working backwards and forwards across the border, accessing public services on both sides of the border, and doing the daily lives. None of this was thought through by two Secretaries of State who were adamant in support of Brexit and stopped their civil servants from doing any work to, pr to put forward a plan that could be put in action if the vote went the way that they wanted and we didn't. The people of Northern Ireland need a Labour government to ensure their lives and not once again become dominated by ideologues who put their views before anything else. Comrades, peace isn't enough. We knew that in 1998 and it's still true today. We need to re build real social justice so we can help communities where young people can maximise their potential, where workers can feel secure in the workplace and at home and where everyone shares in the real prosperity of our shared nations. And there are a list of long-standing issues that still remain to resolve. A woman's right to choose, a proper system of human rights, and the morass of problems that are the legacy of 30 years of conflict. The truth is, comrades, the Tory government won't do anything on these issues. It will only happen when we see the return of a Labour government. And as Carwin just said, we'll only see that through a United Labour Party. This is our historic mission. We can't allow our present dear problems to take us and the great people of Northern Ireland backwards. So let's come together this week and put the needs of our people before anything else, unite and go forward on the Jeremy's leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Conference, over the past 10 years that I have served on the National Executive Committee, it has been a real privilege and an honour to chair Labour Party Conference. With my term of office almost at an end, for the final time, I will now hand over the chair.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellie. Um, conference, it is with great sadness that we close today's session with a tribute to Joe Cox MP, one of our own, a rising star and a bright light, brutally murdered in the service of her constituents. I would first like to ask Rachel Reeves, a great friend of Joe and her husband Brendan, to lead the tributes this afternoon. We'll then watch a short film made to commemorate Joe's life and her work, and Baroness Jan Royal will close the session. Conference, please welcome Rachel. Thank you, Conference. We are here today to honour a friend, a Labour MP and a wonderful, courageous woman. Along with shock, anger and grief, I have very many fond memories of Jo. Jo and I knew each other for around 10 years. I have known her husband, Brendan, for longer. We first met at a Labour Students' Conference about 18 years ago, and it was through Brendan that I first met Jo. I remember Jo and Brendan coming round for dinner at our house and then visiting them on their boat, first in Ladbroke Grove and later in Wapping. I remember worrying early in the evening that I had drunk too much wine until I realised that it was the boat that was swaying and not me. I remember talking with Jo about her future shortly after I became a Member of Parliament. Jo was thinking about standing for Parliament and spent a day shadowing me in my Leeds West constituency, talking to constituents about their problems, campaigning with local party members and attending meetings with me. At the end of the day, a lot of people weren't sure who was the MP and who was doing the shadowing. Jo had a way with people of connecting with people from all walks of life. Jo had a way of just doing that. Jo's main hesitation about a parliamentary career was her young family. She worried, as many of us do, whether you can be a great mum and a great MP at the same time. But when her home seat of Batley and Spen came up, Jo felt a special responsibility to step up and do what she could for the place where she was born, grew up and went to school, the place that Jo called home. Jo wanted to make the world a fairer, more equal, more tolerant, more generous place. We all have better instincts and deepest fears, and Jo appealed to our better instincts. Our sense that, as she said in her maiden speech, we have far more in common than that which divides us. On the 17th of June, less than 24 hours after Jo was killed, I sat in a coffee shop just a few minutes away from where she had been murdered. A woman came over to me and said that she had not known Jo, but that Jo's death had, wanted, had made her want to be a bit more like her, a better person, a better mother, a better daughter, a better wife. It is ironic that having travelled to some of the most damaged, war-ravaged places in the world, Jo, jo died so near to her home. But Jo died doing the job that she loved in the place that she loved, representing the people that she loved. Her mum and dad said to me that Jo would not have changed a thing. She lived the life that she wanted to live. And yet, as her mum said to me, she had so much more that she could have done. Jo was struck down much too soon. And it now falls on all of our shoulders, Jo's friends, MPs, all of us, to carry on Jo's work to combat and guard against hatred, intolerance and injustice, and to serve others with love and with dignity. Jo can't do this now, but we can. So this is the best way that we can remember Jo and all that she stood for. After Jo died, her family set up a fundraising site to raise money for the charities that Jo cared about the White Helmets, the Royal Voluntary Service, and Hope Not Hate. The causes Jo felt so passionate about, the plight of Syrian refugees, extremism, racism, and fighting intolerance, and tackling loneliness and isolation. I am now co-chairing the Jo Cox Commission on Loneliness, which we are launching early next year, working with charities, campaigners, and Jo's family to highlight the scourge of loneliness in modern Britain and showing how together 
we can combat it. Putting into practice the values that Joe lived by. So as we remember Joe, let's also pledge ourselves to continue Joe's work, making real Joe's commitment and conviction that we do indeed have more in common. We will always remember Jo, cherish our memories of her, and dedicate ourselves to Jo's causes. And conference. We know that our party and our country face challenging times. But as we debate, and debate passionately this week, on conference floor and at fringe meetings, we here, all of us, at Labour Party conference, we have far more in common than that which divides us. Let's treat each other as friends and as comrades. As Joe appealed to our common sense of humanity and of seeing the good in people, I urge you, let's live by those values too. And lastly, as I said when I paid tribute to Joe in Parliament, Batley and Spen will go on to elect a new MP on the 20th of October, and we wish her well. But no one can ever replace a mother. Jo, we miss you. Dynamic. Um, enthusiastic. Yeah. She did a variety of amazing things throughout her life. I first met Jo when we were both newly arrived parliamentary researchers. Uh, she worked with me nearly 20 years ago in Brussels when, when I was an MEP. I first met Jo when she worked for Oxfam and she was running their policy and advocacy work, which is all about standing up and fighting for the poorest and most marginalised people in the world. I met Jo when she turned up to do Labour Women's Network's parliamentary candidates training. Definitely one of those people on the course that you look at and think, well, if she decides to do it, she's going to go a long way. You felt her warmth. She was never pompous. Jo's way was to gently persuade, and before you knew where you were, you'd agree to so many things that Jo Cox had really wanted you to do. She wasn't one of these people who would sit around and you know, wring your hands about how awful everything was. What she wanted was to, to make a difference and to think about how she could do that and how we could all collectively try and make things better. That was really what drove her. Jo was the first elected uh, chair of the Labour Women's Network and when she was chair she really took the organisation from strength to strength. From our training programme to our campaigning presence and really making us a force to be reckoned with in the Labour Party and beyond. I normally do the House of Commons tug of war. Uh, this year I was unwell and actually Jo was able to do it. Jo, of course, was not well qualified to be in the tug of war team at all, but nonetheless, like, attacked that rope with great gusto. She was very humorous and mischievous and all the rest of those things, but she was also profoundly serious and that both of those sides of her carried over into being a politician. Jo represented the very best of Labour women. She was a fantastic feminist, um, a passionate fighter for the causes that she believed in. She never, ever, ever lost that faith and that optimism, that politics, collectivism and action could bring about change. I think it was George Osborne who said how much she had changed government policy. You know, even from opposition, she never ever for a moment thought that we couldn't get things done and that stays with me. Jo, I know, would have said organise, campaign for a better world for all our kids, for all our people. We are far more united and have far more in common than that which divides us. Friends, Rachel's tribute and the memories shared in the video encapsulate Jo Cox, a woman who I knew, admired 
and yes, loved for many years because Joe inspired love. Reflecting on Joe's capacity to love and reach out to the world makes things especially poignant and the video clip of Joe standing next to a placard with the words, I demand a world where there's no violence against women and girls. We must continue with those demands and we must continue Joe's work with women in the party, especially with the Joe Cox Women in Leadership program, which is to be delivered in partnership with the LWN. Jo was a beautiful woman, inside and out. She was brave, she was bold, she was clever, she was compassionate, she was adventurous and she was fun. She was a tiny bundle of boundless energy whose enthusiasm for life was infectious. She was truly extraordinary, but also utterly normal, and she understood the daily concerns of her constituents, the community in which she grew up. Jo was a mum who adored her children, and put them first. She was a wife, a daughter, a sister, and a friend. I don't know anyone else with such a wide circle of friends as Joe and Brendan. She had a fantastic capacity for connecting with people, no matter where they came from. One evening last September, I sat round a fire with Joe, Brendan, Leggy, and Callum on the banks of the River Wye outside their cottage. We ate apple and blackberry crumble, blackberries that Joe and the children had gathered in the woods apples from a tree in the garden that Jo had carved out of the forest. This September, together with her beloved family and many friends, I was in the same garden, but Jo was no longer with us. Brendan and their wonderful children were burying Jo's ashes under the apple tree. We wept, but we also celebrated Jo's life, and we remembered all that she did to make this world a better place. Many of us say that we are engaged in politics because we want to change the world. And we do, but that's exactly what Jo did. From Batley to Bosnia and from Syria to Spen, she worked with and for those fleeing war and hunger, with the poorest and most dispossessed. She was a powerful advocate who gave a voice to the voiceless and fought passionately against injustice and for human rights. She was a great human being. And despite the fact that Joe had worked in the most difficult and fragile parts of the world, where the lives of human beings are degraded through poverty, hunger, or conflict, she never ceased to love people and love life. As Brendan said in a brilliant article for the New York Times, Joe was positivity personified. Everyone at this conference will share my pride that Joe was labor. She was labor to the core and rooted in our values of tolerance, human rights, and social justice in this country and throughout the world. But she also understood that in order to bring about real change, you sometimes have to reach out to people of a different political persuasion. She knew how to build bridges and also how to disagree in an agreeable way. Someone wrote in the memorial wall to Joe in Parliament Square, you can't kill democracy. It is true that democracy is fragile, that we have to nurture it through participation. I'm delighted to say that the Memorial Wall will soon be coming to the People's History Museum in Manchester, the National Museum of Democracy, where people will be able to pay tribute to Joe, but also to discuss her legacy. Public service, including politics at national, local, and European level, should be celebrated, not denigrated. As President Obama reminded Brendan and the children last week when they met in the White House, Joe's selfless service to others had made the world a better place. It is a terrible indictment that our politicians are vulnerable and targets of hatred, but it shouldn't be like that. Jo's life was a testament to the fact that, as she said, we have far more in common than that which divides us. Friends, we have so much work to do if we are to eradicate divisions in our party, our communities, our country, and our world. One of the defining issues of our time is the fight against hatred and division in this country and the wider world. One of the reasons that Joe was murdered was her commitment to bringing people together, to nurturing understanding between individuals and communities. She was concerned about the rise of prejudice, populism, and extremism throughout the world. But again, and I quote Brendan, she knew from a life of activism that most people are good and that human empathy is a powerful force for change. Joe believed that we could and must defeat hate even a hate so strong that it could be deadly. It is therefore no accident that one of the recipients of Joe's fund is hope, not hate. 
We cannot and must not be overwhelmed by growing fear and intolerance in our communities, our country and our world. We have to work harder to fight against division and hatred and to stand up for tolerance and diversity. Joe's memory is spurring us on. It might be usual to end a tribute with silence, but Joe was never silent. She spoke out against injustice and she spoke up for human rights. She spoke with passion, she spoke of life, and she spoke of her love for humanity. So let us celebrate her life. Let us hope, not hate, and let us love like Joe. Joe Cox. Thank you, thank you, conference. Uh, we will now take the votes on uh, today's debate. So I think first we're going to start with the Co Communities Policy uh, Commission report. Um, can I see those in favour of accepting the report? Raise your hands. Thank you. And any who are against? That's carried. Uh, next we have the Priority Issues document on housing. All those in favour? And all those against? That's carried. Uh, the Transport Policy Commission report. All those in favour? And all those against? That's carried. And finally, the Priorities <coughs> Issues document on transport. All those in favour? And all those against? That's carried as well. Thank you very much, Conference. Um, I'm now going to ask the Chief Scrutineer, Cathy Mitchell, uh, to present the results of the Contemporary Issues ballot. Cathy. Conference. I'm Cathy Mitchell, Chief Scrutineer. I will now give the result of the priorities ballot, which determines the contemporary motions that will be debated at this year's conference. The National Executive Committee has agreed that for contemporary resolutions, the four subject areas achieving the, the greatest percentage of votes cast in the CLP section and the four achieving the greatest percentage of votes in the trade union and other affiliated organisations section will be timetabled. However, should any subject area be selected in both sections, 
then the subject area with the next highest ranking vote from the appropriate section will be added to the list, ensuring that the net result will be that eight resolutions are selected. That's four by affiliated organisations and four by CLPs. Other arrangements for the ballot remain as previously advertised. I will announce voting for the constituency section of the priorities ballot as the actual number and as a percentage of the votes cast. For Brexit, 160,527, that's 13.44%. Child refugees, 185,561, that's 15.53%. Colombia, 3,115.26%. Defend and promote public services, 49,028, and uh, that's 4.1%. Employment rights, 56,255, 4.71%. Energy, 28,481, that's 2.38%. Grammar schools, 218,790, 18.32%. Holiday hunger campaign, 83,007, that's 6.95%. Housing, 196,337, 16.44% of the vote. Industrial strategy, 20,191. That's 1.69%. Uh, NATO and instability in Turkey, 13,987, 1.17%. NHS, 179,200. Uh, that represents 15% of the vote. Voting for the trade unions and other affiliated organisations section will also be announced as the actual number and as a percentage of the votes cast. Brexit, 20,622.25%. Child refugees, 39,984.48%. Colombia, 187, 0%. Defend and promote public services, 2,051,803. That's 24.52%. Employment rights, 2,055,873, 24.54%. Energy, 1,999,923, that's 23.9%. Grammar schools, 35,727.43% of the vote. Holiday hunger campaign, 1,765, that's 0.02%. Not, not point, point not Housing, 84,484, 1.01%. Industrial strategy, 1,994,821, 23.84% of the vote. NATO and instability in Turkey, 187, 0%. And the NHS, 82,813.99%. Therefore, the eight topics that will be timetabled for debate are as follows. Child refugees, defend and promote public services, employment rights, energy, grammar schools, housing, industrial strategy and the NHS. The Chair of the CAC has asked me to announce compositing meetings will be held this evening on the upper floor of the ACC. Meetings will be held at either 6.30pm or 7.45pm. The 6.30pm meetings will be for the Energy, Grammar Schools, NHS and Defend and Promote Public Services subject groupings. The 7.45pm meetings will be for the child refugees, employment rights, housing and industrial strategy subject groupings. Thank you, conference.
Thanks very much, uh, Cathy. That concludes our business uh, for today's conference, so we now stand adjourned until 9.30am tomorrow morning.